Yeah, get it on. Got to get on. A choice but a mandate. Get it on. Thanks for tuning in. I love that about you. Andrew Lopez is in studio. Platonic. Yay. The seasons uh, shall return uh, with new episodes uh, July 7th on Apple TV and then uh, The Bear, which I've seen a million spots for because everyone loves chef stuff now. That's uh, streaming on Hulu as well. Live dates, you can go to andrewlopez.me. I couldn't get .com. <laughs> it was so it's sad. A, it's a common name. Yeah. Yeah. It's a common name. <laughs> it but was, for live dates, for stand-up yes, dates. Yes, yeah. For stand-up dates, you go there. and it's. Uh, but I was really bummed about that. Like, I, The person that has andrewlopez.com is like a blogger who is a teacher who plays his soul but hasn't posted in like five years. Give it up. Man. I know. I'm like... Let a D-list, uh, D-list comic get in there. You <laughs> Can know? you buy it off them? I messaged him so many times and nothing. But he's clearly renewing it, so I think he's holding on. I well, was, <laughs> he's probably waiting for you to pop. Yeah. yeah, yeah, <laughs> what, yeah. I, what I would say is don't hold your breath. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pay him. I'll pay him out. He's, he deserves the money more than me. I just say dick jokes on stage. He actually is teaching America. <laughs> well, now, uh, Andrew, I know you're... Share some of the uh, Filipino persuasion with uh, Chris Mac Zapata. And Chris Mac Zapata, who eats uh, shrimp tails, <laughs> he and I have a lot in common in, in terms of not wasting food or throwing away food. But I don't know if that's a Filipino <laughs> thing is. or just a poor thing. I, it's both. I think it's, it's both. both. And that's also very Filipino to be both. Yeah. And I, I suck the bones. Good. Try it. You have to. The I, marrow. Yes, the marrow. I get it all out. I have gout. So like, <laughs> like I, me too. Do you have gout? Dude, I have gout. I have gout. That's <laughs> so, the most Filipino thing about me. All right. So <laughs> then tell me what you think of this. Because I, I may have had not an old timer, but probably a top five of not wasting food and mm-hmm. shit. All the stuff that involves not wasting food basically is just shit that grosses women out <laughs> who have money when you explain to them what you would do or what you have done. Uh, at the Burbank Airport on Friday, waiting to catch a Southwest flight out of town, uh, sitting with Mike August, whose nickname is the Stone Pelican, which <laughs> means he will eat anything, and uh, noticed that the table behind us got the big Guy Fieri salad, chicken salad, um, big sandwich with all the accoutrements, another Guy Fieri offering there, turkey sandwich, avocado, tomato, and everything, and a bag of the best chips, mesquite, the mesquite barbecue chip, Mm -hmm. with open, everything's open, everything's had one dip. Mm. Like the chips had like one handful, the sandwich had one bite, and the salad probably had one scoop. Mm. They get up and they leave. Mike is eyeballing this table yeah. <laughs> with fifty-seven dollars worth of food <laughs> left on it. Um, Mike wants the food. Yeah. Yes. He should. I yeah. say you deserve the food. Do it. We yeah. deserve the food. Yeah. The people. Yeah, congratulations. He, he then uh, he's worried that the pe- people are going to circle back and find that we've taken their food. Snooze, you lose. I think. Yeah. That's I, fine. I said, and nah. you can even share that with them. That's a meal that to share at that point. <laughs> it's family style, except yeah. for you, Pat. <laughs> I think that's. Cr- I actually think that's insane that they walked away from that. And also, Guy Fieri's food, fire, dude. I know it's Love good. It. We <laughs> didn't, but we didn't. He didn't know if they were coming back. I assured him that they were long gone. Yes. That they walked with purpose with their luggage to make a flight. Yes. So Mike then went over to the table, took it all, transferred it to our <laughs> table. Did you yeah. eat any of it? Fuck yeah. I, ate. <laughs> I was not only eating the salad, I was using Mike's fork when he was done with the salad. He'd push it my way and then he'd pull the sandwich. It's all communal. It's communal. Now what we did, because we're we're technicians, is with the sandwich, we ate around the person's mm-hmm. bite mm-hmm. for as long as we could. Mm-hmm. But eventually, yeah. you're gonna get there. Yeah. Yeah. We got, yeah. we I, got there. I do that a lot. I always eat around my friends' bites when I eat their food. But then eventually, it's like you're so hungry. It's so good, you eat it. I will say this: the the thing about Filipinos too. In that situation, we are good at making sure that the entire thing with our hands is like shared and clean somehow and then still be able to eat with our hands. That situation sounds perfect for me. I could kill that situation. Chip, the chips were a no brainer. I, that, yeah. I hit the chips first. I went salad second, worked my yeah. way to the sandwich, but amazing. Uh, we what, felt good about ourselves. And did you eat another meal after that too? You guys were sitting? No, we just, we, we walked, once we landed uh, in Oakland, we were looking for free food because <laughs> <laughs> now precedent has been 
been set. Yeah. We can no longer Who's pay for away food. From their food. Who's walked away from a sandwich? Uh, sadly, we had to pay for our own food. Uh, well, that, we can go hunt at the Glendale Gallery at, that, at that point. But it's it is a Filipino and a poor person thing. yeah yeah i agree and also I, i'm from iowa and i also think it's a midwest thing like why like i would never you know my all, everybody i grew up around worked so hard and food is so expensive and a lot of people made food it's like i i'll even if i'm full i'll eat it like it's, yes that's what it's there to throw that away was is batshit to me yeah andrew says uh, that he sucks on bones this is gonna sound like a weird sense but i do that too i suck on my wife's bones like her chicken bones or my mm-hmm. friends mm-hmm. like whenever they have meat on there i'll, I'll finish those things off you suck on your wife's bones i man. do so smooth so yeah i i'm i'm with you waste not want not mm. drives drives me nuts insane tired of being called gross all the time <laughs> but <laughs> i think we all get sick less than the Average American, other than the aforementioned gout, yeah, yeah, <laughs> is that is that a Filipino thing? I weirdly feel like it is, but I mean, all of our food has is just like all like red meat rich, acids, yeah, so rich like, in purines, yeah. It's but it's beer does it too. I mm. literally get, I, I'll get the gout and then still eat my Filipino food though, because I just like I can't. I don't know. I don't know how bad yours is, but I eat through the pain. My ankle will swell up to like a tennis ball. Yeah, mm. and I can't walk. And it's pain. It's so painful. The last time I really had bad gout, we uh, we had a we were flying to Oklahoma City, and we had a layover at Denver Airport, which is the biggest airport in the country. Yes, and we had to walk from one um, one airline to the to another. And I had gout, and I had my bags. And you met up, or Dennis <laughs> Quaid sat like at this at the same like mm-hmm. like a row ahead of you or something. Mm-hmm. So you guys walked together off together and you're just like all right chris see you at the next uh see you at the next air or terminal and i just I'll find my it. way just sw- it was like the lord of the rings journey like i had to like, <laughs> get there on my own just with gout Dude. couldn't even walk so another another subject from the road because i know you go on the road a lot open for joe coy for a year or pl- year a plus couple, a couple of years yeah and i and the first time i met him was in this studio actually i ran into him at a rest i ran into him at a filipino restaurant and then the next day he invited me when his podcast was here to come uh do a podcast with him and that's how i met him so this he's is, a very generous oh, wow. very yeah. generous yeah. person he loves you he talks about you all the time how you put him on on the podcasting on everything like he well, he, he, I mean, Joe is super funny, obviously, always, always brought it and always dear. Yeah. You know, he's just a, he's just a sweet guy. So earnest. Yes, he's, he's earnest. Mm-hmm. And I don't know where that comes from. I think it's from being poor. <laughs> I mean, like, I think it's literally from being I like, was poor. I'm not earnest. Do you not think you're earnest? I, as a fan of you, I would say that you're earnest. I would say that you like you don't shy away from the. You just told a story about how you ate somebody else's food. <laughs> well, is uh, but earnest isn't honest, I guess. Even though they sound yeah. remarkably familiar, or they yeah. they sound close, earnest and honest. I I think I'm honest. Mm-hmm. I think Joe Coy is probably honest too. But then he's earnest There's and earnest. honest. Yeah. I'm not earnest. You don't mean the things you say. I mean everything I say. I just don't say a lot of things like, H- how's your family? Yeah. Uh, you know, that, yeah. That would be an earnest person's I territory. Think, so I think earnest is honest with a side of goodwill. A care. Intention. Yeah, you have to care. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, it's honest and you care. You know that question, though, too, even there, but I, I've, because you're, you have a talent to make things funny, but then also dig into people's shit. I mean, that's your whole, like, the things that people, and people are open with you. I think that you bring earnesty out of people. That's for sure. Uh, yeah, I, I think if people feel like you're asking because you want to know versus get a headline or mm-hmm. gotcha moment or something like that, most, most people, you, if you interview them properly, will open up and say many things that maybe they possibly wouldn't have said into a, yeah. a microphone if they think your intentions are good. I think it's a lot about yeah. intentions. Yeah, and that's where I think, like, and, and that's the earnest part of it, too, where I feel... Like, well, has anyone ever got you on a got you thing that you regret doing? No, people, well, in the in the honest and somewhat earnest department, I feel compelled to answer every question that is asked of me if, if I can do it. Mm-hmm. And sometimes, like I remember when I was taking over for Howard Stern and they said, you can't talk about it. So I was like, all right, well, if I can't, that's part of the deals. I can't talk about it. And then I did Letterman and 
they said, are you taking over for Howard Stern? And I said, well, I can't talk about it. And if I go out and Dave asks me, then I can't talk about it. So mm-hmm. why bother? And then and then he asked me, you know, of course, <laughs> immediately, because he's either earnest or honest or something. Yeah, yeah. But <clears throat> if but if you ask me, like, like what probably got me into most the most or some of the most trouble uh, I've been in is uh, interview many years ago. And just at the very end of a long interview, the guy's like, who's funnier, men or women? Mm. <laughs> and I was like, wow. I can't say. Uh, I won't answer, and I can't say they're the same because that's <laughs> statistically probably going to be impossible. So I said that men are funnier, but uh, Sarah Silverman and Kathy Griffin are funnier than anyone I went to high school with, and we we're funnier because we're compelled to be funnier because we need to get light. Yeah. yeah. Whereas women, it doesn't really work in that department, yeah. so they focus on other things because ultimately each species is about. Sex is about just being more attractive to yeah, the other side yeah. in terms of evolution. In your experience. So yeah. I explained it that way, and then it turned into uh, Adam says women aren't funny, and then, uh, you know. Yeah. Dark times. Dark times. Dark times. <laughs> <Yeah>. Dark times. <laughs> <laughs> then it eventually turns into, I'm not funny. Yeah, you find out Adam's like, uh, they're funnier than anybody I went to high school with. You find out that Adam went to an all-girls school. <laughs> 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 but no, I get that. The thing is, like, that that's such an interesting thing because they know – I mean, I, the intention there is they're trying to, like, so – to hurt anybody. And, like, that's so weird to me because I feel like if you're going to ask that question, you kind of – if you have a guest on your show, you have to answer that hard question first and then allow the guests to harp on your – your mm-hmm. hard take, I think, like, because mm-hmm. otherwise they're just trying to trick you, which is yes. so horrifying. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, when you're – earnest and honest you don't perceive the trickery mm. you, you don't perceive the dishonesty you know mm. i i talk to lots of people and they'll go yeah bullshit you know that guy blah 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 and i'll go that's not what he said to me and they go yeah but he was lying and i go why would he lie like it, it's a it's a very naivete yeah. kind of childlike approach to life yeah and and well it's it's interesting too because it's like i i don't think you can be funny if you don't know that either though you know, like I think that it, that's where you get to the, the realm of people who are funny on accident. Were you always funny? Was it something that was always in you? Uh, to go back to what you were saying about the, the, the thing about men, it's like I think that I – no, I don't think I was. I think I was angry. And mm-hmm. that had, and I had to find a new way to, to channel that into a way that I can communicate that. Um, my friends were always funnier than me, but they were so fucking stupid that they didn't know they were being funny. Mm-hmm. And But I could tell they were being funny. And I was like, oh, I see. And I think picking those things up and being able to communicate um, and, and kind of finding an amalgamation of like uh, uh, communication was how I then can figure out how to talk. You say your friends were funny, but then they were just being stupid. I had, did like, they yeah, know it? Like, like my friend Ross, like my friend Ross, um, he is a dumb dumb, but he's so earnest and funny. Like, I, I remember one time I was telling him, like, dude, you remind me of the guy in Remember the Titans. He goes, fuck Remember the Titans. I'm Ross, bro. <laughs> and like, that's the funniest thing to say, like so earnestly, like getting offended. <laughs> and like for the rest of like the football, like I was played, I played football with him. For, so the rest of football practice, every time he did a great play, he'd be like, I'm fucking Ross, bro. Like doubling down. <laughs> And you know, I so don't. It's funny think, to you. Yeah, it's funny to me, and yeah. I don't think he knows that that's a funny thing to do, and it, that is just somebody that's like surviving moment by moment and being earnest. And I think earnesty is funny. I had to figure out how to make that a, a job. <laughs> like, well, I I have a couple of unintentionally funny stories and slash encounters that I had uh, whilst traveling over the weekend. Um, and maybe this will fall under the heading of these people are super funny, except for they didn't know it. They were mm-hmm. just dumb. But I was in Monterey. I forgot my uh, sleep mask. I sleep mm-hmm. with a sleep mask. It blocks out the light and it's padded. It's a big, fat, padded one. I sleep with my head on my hand. So my knuckles don't leave an, an impression on my face. I have this pad. It's like sleeping with a pillow strapped to your head if you sleep on your face. And I need it to sleep. And I fucking forgot it. Oh, no. And these things are not found in the wild for some <laughs> for some reason. What seems like it would it'd be good, like every third American should have one. Yeah. They do not. 
<laughs> and I went into, and, and no one even knows what they're called. They're called like an eye shade or sleeping mask or something. But I went into the CVS, had a horrible night, Friday night, forgot it. Next day, Monterey, had a couple hours to kill. Went into a giant CVS in Monterey that had every kind of douche and every kind of cream and every kind of multivitamin. I mean, just, it had every every stroke cane, every, you know, every uh, toilet seat strapped to a walker. You know, it's like it had everything. So I'm like, there mu- so I go to the person, but but it's unclear where the eye shade aisle is because it's not exactly an elderly right. thing and it's not certainly not a food and it's not a multivitamin. Mm-hmm. It's not it's not a Tylenol. You know, like where? It could, yeah, it could be in a few different. It could yeah. be in a few yeah. departments. Apparel. So I go down. I I risk talking to a human being who works <laughs> there, which is always a risk these days. And it's just like a six year old woman, and she's behind the counter, and I don't know what her nationality is, but it isn't this? You know, it's mm-hmm. not here, mm-hmm. but it's something. And she speaks English fine, and I say, uh, "Do you uh, do you have an eye shade? Do you sell a?" Eye mask and eye shade. I'm doing the thing with my hands on my <laughs> yeah. face. Oh boy! You know, and she goes, "Oh, um, hmm. Let me let let let's look. Let's look." And then we she walks out from behind the counter. We walk across the store. We go to the refrigerated deli oh. <laughs> refrigerator. Yeah, the, you want it made out of bologna? The right? one with the string yeah. cheese and yeah. stuff, and, and the provolone. And we just stand in front of it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like. I, this is funny. It's super funny to me. I I don't think she's, I would do it if I worked there and I was 19. That would be funny to me. And we stood in front of the deli refrigerated (laughs) section. And I was like, I, I don't think what I'm talking about can be found in, in here. There is head cheese, which has the word head in it. Mm -hmm. But I don't think this is what I'm looking for. And she's like, Okay, uh, <laughs> then we don't have it. And I'm oh. like, I, I, I don't know what you think. I'm, yeah, if yeah. you think I'm talking about knockwurst, <laughs> and I'm holding my hand in front of my eyes, going a shade, a sleeping shade, yeah. and you think that's spreadable cheese? Yeah, yeah. Slap I'm not. Then meat. I'm not doing a good job. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's very nice of you to walk through groceries, though, knowing you're going the wrong way, yeah. and just letting her take you. You entertain that for <laughs> yeah. way too long. You're well, like, honestly, we I thought we we're gonna head over to the the deli fridge and then make a hard left <laughs> and head up the aisle, but we didn't. We stopped. That's so. So what? So what ended up? Did you just slowly walk away from each other? She did the. I don't think we have it. I did the based on your baloney offering. I'm gonna look around a little myself, you know, because I'm not I'm not sure that yeah. you know exactly what I'm asking yeah, yeah. for here. Yeah, that's why. Also, I think you should sell those on your tour. That would be mm. I would because that sounds like that would help. I'm a CPAP guy, but if I had one of those too, I feel like I'd be out. You're CPAP. I'm a CPAP man. Joe Coy's a CPAP. Gout and CPAP, and I'm 33. It's disgusting. Is, is that a Filipino thing? <laughs> I think so. I, I don't know. It might be. When I went to Joe's house, he was showing me a CPAP yeah, machine. And I was yeah. like, you're skinny and young. Okay, it's, what do you have a, big a CPAP yeah. for? Uh, Joe is the one that told me to get a CPAP. I didn't know this, but like, I was like sleeping on the tour bus, and he woke me up, and he's like, you're going to fucking die. He's <laughs> like, you snore like a, a monster. You're going to die. And then I went and got a, a, a sleep study, and I wake up like 60 times an hour. Really? It's crazy. As a, and this was when I was 30. So like, it's, yeah, I, I'm like, you know, I'm not skinny, but I think it's just my, I got a big ass tongue. They wouldn't I just cast on. you in a CPAP commercial. No, they would. They should though. It is an undiagnosed thing for skinny people everywhere. I feel yes. like CPAP, you need it if you're snoring at night. It's real. Saved my life. The other uh, unintentionally funny story that I'd don't think I talked about on the air was um, in Vegas. I went to Smith's gas station. Never I don't think I talked no. about this. This is another instance of an employee being unintentionally hysterical, <laughs> except for I couldn't <laughs> laugh, yeah. but I was standing there. Um, tooling around Nevada, going to do a show on a, on a Thursday night at Kimmel's Club. Had a little time to kill. Stopped at the gas station to get a water. The Smith's gas station was across the parking lot from the Smith's supermarket, a chain 
in Nevada, evidently, has a way of, of paying for things, which is the water's on the outside, along with like some other snacks and stuff. And then you have to walk it to the Lucite cage with the drawer mm. in it and the person locked in there. I'm guessing during the nighttime hours or something, mm-hmm. or maybe they move the rack in during the nighttime or mm-hmm. something. So I get my water and I go to the cage with the shark cage with the Lucite thing in the drawer, but there's nobody in there. So then I look to my right and I see the attendant, the the woman who works for the station, who's a a 68-year-old woman of color wearing the smock and stuff, and she's helping somebody on pump seven. So I'm going to have to wait for her to get done. And then she comes around when she's done and she walks around to the door who lets her into the cage and then announces after trying the doorknob that she's locked out. Oh, whoa. So I said, oh, okay. So I got this water and I got my money, but you're locked out of this place that accepts the money. And she goes, my phone's in there too. I said, yeah, all right. That checks out. And she goes, can I borrow your phone to call my manager? Right? And I go, well, first off, I can't say no because I'm holding my phone and you're standing in front of me and you're a black woman. You know, what am I going to do? It's 2023. It's going to be a hate crime. crime So I go, "Uh, uh, yeah, you you can borrow my phone. And I take the phone and I put on the numbers setting so it's just the keypad with the numbers on it and i hand it to her and she looks at it for two beats and then she looks up at me and she goes do you know the number of her manager yes and i was like that would make me a warlock. Oh, I'd be yeah. a warlock if I knew if I knew this number, yeah. I would own this entire fucking city. Yeah. Like that's so wild. <laughs> I'm like, no, I just she goes, did own and I went like, you know, the comedian part of me, it's yeah. like I don't know it off the hand, but if you just go manager Jeff, yeah, yeah it's yeah. gonna <laughs> pop up. <laughs> Smith, Carson City, yeah. yeah, it'll pop up. Like, like wow. no. I'm, and I'm not even sure why. She is there some confusion? Yeah. And she goes, well, I got to find his number out and, and I got to call him so he can get us in here. And I'm like, okay, I'm just holding the water at this point, which yeah. is now warm in my hand, yeah. you know? And I go, oh, okay. And I go, once you get hold of him, can he like open the door like with an app or the phone or the, the ring doorbell <laughs> yeah. buzz or or something yeah, and, remotely. And she looks at me and she goes, he's not in there. Oh. And she pointed at this four by four booth with nobody in it. Yeah, goes, didn't you check? He's not, I mean, if he was in there, yeah, he could let me the in. Door. But he's, he's not. This is so horrifying that she's holding your phone while yeah. saying these things. I know. And I was like, wow, this is a crazy yeah. conversation you're to like, have. You're like, the number for your manager is 911, and right. please help me. She's thinking one step behind. Yes. So um, she goes, well, I'm going to call 411. I said, okay. And so she <laughs> used my phone. And at that point, I was like, how committed am I to this water? You know, how badly do yeah. I do? The hotel's a mile away. Yeah. I'll get water there, you know? Yeah. And and so she calls 411 and it's busy or something. Mm-hmm. And then she goes, well, okay. And she just starts walking for the Smith supermarket that's 100 yards across. Like she's turning her. She's left her post. At this point, she's just walking. Yeah. Now, that's that's where we that's, cut that's bait. I was like, all right. That's cr- Did you grab your phone back? I got my phone back. I put the water back. I should have taken the yeah, water at yeah, that yeah, point. Yeah. I had time. I had a lot of sweat equity yes. you're in that honest. water. You're too, yeah. So you're too honest. Yeah, and at that point, I don't think that that woman would have gave a shit if you yeah. would have walked away with so that I'm water. I'm saying she's still there yeah. waiting. Do you, uh, you guys ever have this happen when you then... The story to me is now fantastical. The, mm. the fact that she would ask 
if I knew her manager's phone number after asking mm-hmm. to borrow my phone. That's incredible. Right? Yeah. Right. Now, I didn't say as a former Smith's employee of over 21 years, I've seen it all. And I've never seen someone get like, I didn't say anything. I'm just a guy with out of town plates who was standing there holding a water in gym shorts. You, you know, so I get it. I didn't set the table. But do you guys know, you feel my pain. It's mean. You want to tell this story because it's fantastical. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. But the person you're telling it to is doesn't find it that fantastical and got mired. The person I told the story to got mired in what was she doing at the pump? So I was like, I'm waiting at the I'm waiting at the thing. She's over at pump seven, like helping someone. What was she doing at the pump? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Somebody's yeah. credit card or something needed to be reswiped. What was she doing over there? I, can we just move yeah. on to this part? Yeah. That's not the fascinating part. Yeah, yeah. The part where she's helping people to pump is very consistent with her job. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. not the crazy part of this story. Yeah, bad listeners. That's yeah, like, yeah, bad, yeah, yeah. Li- obsessed with the pump. Yes, what happened at yes. the pump? That's a, that's a, I totally get that. And that is basically ev- like all of... That's another stupid person. <laughs> you're telling the story to another. Stu- it's like you're telling the story to the lady at the pump. <laughs> like, yes. she, like, and I think that um, I, I have to catch myself doing that. So do you, well, here's a, here's a crazier question, like a mirror question. I wonder if comics are also bad listeners because if somebody that's telling you a terrible story, I'm just looking to, to derail it because it's so awful. Right. But that's the thing. You're not a bad storyteller, but there are times where people are trying to tell me a story. And if I know this is going nowhere, I will be like, well, what the fuck happened at the pump? Because <laughs> yeah. I hate whatever you're going to tell Let's me. Get to the point. Well, yeah, the punchline. Get uh, let, to the point. Let's at least do this. If there can be bad storytellers, mm-hmm. which there are, there must be bad story listeners. Yes. Because I feel like I've run into a lot of them in my life. Where yeah. they, <laughs> they seize on the wrong, you know, you'd say the story and they go, so what happened with the water? And you go yeah. like, that's not <laughs> that's the story. That's not the story of what happened with the water. Like you're, you're, you're hitting the wrong syllable. Yeah. You're <laughs> emphasizing the wrong syllable in this word. Yeah, yes, yes. That, that is very real. I feel like that, that is Ross. My friend yeah. Ross from high school would be that guy. Like, like it doesn't realize like when he goes, I'm fucking Ross, he's not listening to what yeah. I'm saying to him. I'm like, you're a good football player is what I'm telling you. And he goes, no. I'm Ross. You're not listening to my story. So I did grow up around a lot of those people, and they were all very dumb. I'll do that if I'm looking at my phone and half listening. I'll follow mm-hmm, up with a mm-hmm. question like that. But yeah, if you're actually listening, that's not a follow-up. Yeah, definitely. All right. Well, we'll take a break. Another crazy Vegas story, but I'll encourage uh, you as well. <laughs> story from the road. Story of fans. Story of people. I story think, of travel. I think that... Uh, do we, do all these I'm teasing it. I'll give you a moment to uh, cue it up. (laughs) Andrew Lopez is here. We'll take a quick break. I'm right back right after this. Well, let me tell you about my friends at Just Thrive. You have so much stress. You want to hit a pause button and just breathe. Just calm from Just Thrive. Well, they can help. Oh, man, this stuff works. I I take it every day now. Just Calm's all-natural blend of mood-lifting, psychobiotics, and brain-nourishing B vitamins helps you take back control and feel like the most cool calm and collected version of yourself. Multiple studies prove it works quickly to soothe everyday stress and sharpen focus in as little as four weeks or just just drive probiotic. That's what I took this morning. A spore probiotic that banishes gas and bloat and uh, helps your gut produce more serotonin, which is your happy hormone. Plus, it supports better sleep as well. I know the owners of this company and the founders of this company. I went out to dinner with them. We had Tina Anderson on our show. She's great. This is important to her. It should be important to you. Just Thrive, right, Dawson? With Just Calm and Just Thrive Probiotic, you'll have the ultimate stress-fighting duo to help you feel cool, collected, and in control. Get 20% off your first 90-day bottle of Just Calm and Just Thrive Probiotic today. Visit JustThriveHealth.com and use promo code ADAM. It's time to check Adam's voicemail. Ace man, we haven't played rich man, poor man in a while. Got one for you. What's a rich man and a poor man have in common? Plenty of natural light in the home. Get it on. You can leave us a message at 888-634-1744. 
Wow. That was weird. Andrew Lopez is here. He's a comedian. He's an actor. He's a writer. Do you direct? I direct, too, yeah. And directs as well. He's, he, you sold a show recently, right? I saw, Yeah, I, 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 sold, I, have a, I sold a show to FX. I sold a show to Amazon. And yeah, I, yeah. I tricked a lot of people. <laughs> I don't know how I did it. But, yeah, I, I'm still learning, though. So it's been, it's, it's been a fun journey. But I just want to do everything. Yeah, like, why, why not? not? Why not? Now is the time to, to do it. And if I fail at it, it's funny. Um, so w- during that break, when uh, the guy said, rich man, poor man, a lot of natural light, somebody turned the light on outside simultaneously. Yeah. But The extra light's in here. Which they never do. But it's why did they do here. that? And then why was it based on extra? It was yeah. like, and here is confused. <laughs> it's, but it wasn't. That was a weird, that was weird timing. Yeah. Though. It wasn't four seconds after the tape of the guy saying extra light. It was one second after he said extra light, the room lit up. And it never does. And somebody just walked by and flipped the switch on. Uh, but yeah. why would someone do that? Yeah, Adam came to me. Adam Sure from Chassis came to me and said this looks a little dark, and I agreed. And he told me that the lights weren't like there were two different lights to set up, and and I oh you did it for filming purposes. I, I did. And oh then well, upon well, turning on the second set of lights, the it looked way too bright for some reason. So hmm. this, I just got to futz with it a little bit. Mm. Wow, weird. Now, wink a dink. I never know. Is it because you heard the word light? Is it because he heard the word? There's no connection. Just he, the caller recorded, says the word light, and less than a second later, the room lights up. It was 100% coincidence. Wow. wow. Look at us. Crazy. Warlock. So, uh, stories, road. I got another weird, drunken elevator story. But, oh, let's go. But, but I don't want to step on your, your mirth. Well, I, no, you know. You okay, know. well then, then, then you jump into this story. Okay. Vegas is a good town to hang out in because their drunken people get into elevators all day at all hours. Now, normally you have to wait until the wee hours for the drunk person to come into the elevator, but in Vegas, they'll, at noon, one o'clock, mm-hmm. sun shining. Just drunk people yep. piling 8, in. Fifteen a.m. blackout into into Ball elevators. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's fun. Mm-hmm. So you always take a high floor at the hotel and then experience <laughs> drinking all the local color in between yes. the lobby and and in your thirty first floor. So I'm sitting up there. I just get in on the thirty first and stops on the 29th. and a uh, and two women, middle aged, kind of attractive, both holding a beer. Come in and they're they're mid conversation as they as they come in and I'm just alone, and so they come into the elevator walking and talking. Don't even notice I'm there. They and the first thing I hear is, "Oh, he's so attentive. He's the kind of guy who would put your phone on the charger if you fell asleep and your phone wasn't hooked up to the charger, and he's sweet and he can cook." I mean, this guy's like a chef. He's like a world-class chef and super attentive. And, of course, I just look at both of them and I go, you guys talking about me? (laughs) And they both look at me like, no. Nice. (laughs) No. (laughs) But I thought it'd be funny. Yeah, Yeah, that's funny. funny. You know what I mean? And then they looked and they went, oh, you're Uh. you're the guy. You're the judge on the chef show. And I go, No. And they go, oh, yeah. Doesn't he look familiar? (laughs) He looks familiar. She, he's the chef judge. He's a judge on the chef show. And I go, no. And both of them are now convinced because they said chef. And then I said, jokingly, you talking about me. And then they recognized me from some contractor show. They recognized me from yeah. so, they were drunk in their drunken brain. They've invented a memory. They've invented yeah, a memory, yeah, yeah. but it was based on me looking familiar. Like yes. that guy's been on TV and he said chef and we yes. said chef and we're drunk. <laughs> yeah. So he's the guy who's the judge from the yeah. chef show. So I was like, I'm not. And, and they're like, should we get a picture with you? And I go, (laughs) kind of. You kind of should, because part of you, the drunk part, thinks I'm the chef, but then there's another part who would sober up, and then your husband would go, that's the guy from the man show or whatever. I do look familiar for a reason, but it's not because I'm a judge. 
on a chef show. And there, so then we get out of the elevator and now we're staying in the lobby. This is my fault for talking. I should have <laughs> fucking bit yeah. my lip. But, but when he said so conscientious and so kind, and he's the kind of guy who yeah. put the phone on the charger, I had to pipe up. Yeah, I think that's, that's it was very charming. But by the way, you just made their day, though. That's a great story for them to tell now. Like, that's that's the gift that kept on giving. <laughs> if they ever figured it out. <laughs> so then they go, they were like, then we're in the lobby and they go, we should get a picture with you, right? <laughs> and I go, not because I'm the judge on the chef show, but for other reasons, maybe. Yeah, yeah. It's it's not a it's not a fool's errand to take a picture with me, but it's not what you're thinking. Yeah, yeah. Did you take the picture? Yeah, I took the picture. <laughs> See, when people do that to me, people will mistake me for something. Sometimes, like a friend, like I'm high, like I think I went to high school with you, and I just go, "We did." And I, I own it. I let them have it because I don't want to. I don't want to burst their balloon. They know you from somewhere, but yeah. they can't think of where. And it's like good to see you. I it's was in an outback steakhouse in San Diego about almost twenty years ago, and a prom group comes up to me. I'm having dinner with some friends, and this prom group comes up and they say, "Hey, we don't really want to bother you, but are you Steve the Pirate?" <laughs> and my friends and I look at each other. And my friends gonna be look like, "Well, are you?" And I said. <laughs> Yeah, they're like, can we take a picture? I said, yeah, let's keep it quiet. So somewhere yeah. on somebody's mantle <laughs> is a prom picture of them with Steve the Pirate, but it's me. <laughs> I, yeah, I, one of those I heard was I, I, somebody came up to me. I was out to eat as well, and somebody comes up and goes, hey, uh, are you Pablo Torre from ESPN? And I just looked him in the face, and I went, Da 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 da, <laughs> and then I just walked. Away. So forever, that person's telling stories that Pablo Torre went da 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 da. da. <laughs> but I love that because then they that that just makes their day. You know, yeah. I'm not gonna. I'll, I'll let them have it. I told you, I, I took pictures of the Guy Fieri impersonator in Milwaukee. All right, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I had a um, now the, the bet. I had both at, at one time. I had drunken guy with not as drunk friend with drunken guy saying he he knew me from high school he was doing what you got mm -hmm. so they got the one guy is going i know you from where is it from is it from high school did we play some pop warner football where'd you play little league did you grow up in the valley and his friend kept yelling at him, he's on TV, right? But the drunken guy would have none of it. Yeah, yeah, he's like, stop. He, he knew me from somewhere, and his friend kept yelling, from TV. <laughs> and he kept wanting to know what junior high I went to, and his friend just kept yelling at him, from TV, which is nice, because I got to experience yeah. both sides. That's so great. I love that. Those are That's so funny. That should be in a TV show. That seems like, that's real life funny shit like that is, that's the earnest thing that's funny to Can me. Can't make it up. You can't make it up. That's so how great. could you make up the woman who works at the Smith's <laughs> gas station asking me if I knew the number of her manager? You wouldn't, you, it's so crazy. If you were yeah. writing that, you'd go, no, no one, no one would ever say that. This so is not plausible. Yes, yeah. <laughs> why would she say that? You can't. You can't it's do it. Actually, funny. happened. That is real thing. It's like there are things. Real life is always going to be funnier than anything that you can make up sometime because it's real. Like, and that's that's why I think that like that's why live in comedy will never go away. Like we're seeing people watch comedy less. Like movies and theaters aren't working as much. Like late night shows aren't working as much. They're not as funny. But like live comedy will never go away because you can't ever recreate that moment. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think that like real shit will always be funnier than anything we can make up in Hollywood. Is touring and opening the cushiest gig around? Yes, I think so. Because you guys are playing comic. what size venues? When I started with Joe, we were doing sold out theater. So it was mm -hmm. like 3,000 people. Um, and then when I was leaving tour in like 2020, he was at arena level. So he mm -hmm. was doing like the forum. And, you know, there were some shows I was doing 10,000 people. But, um, and, and to kind of give the quick backstory, I, I was an open mic comedian who was trying to become, I wanted to make movies, I still want to make movies, but growing up in Iowa, the only way I could get close to the industry was stand up, because I was the only thing that was around entertainment in small town Iowa that I saw around, like there was a funny bone a couple miles away. So like, mm -hmm. um, I started doing stand up and I was bad at it. Uh, ran into Joe Coy at a restaurant in LA, Filipino restaurant, and I just told him, you were the only Filipino comedian I'd ever seen when I was in Iowa, and I'm a big fan, and he said, come on my podcast, and from there, he was like, come on the road, and I'll teach you how to do stand-up. Wow. So, like, I was doing theaters right away, and just 
eating shit, like not knowing what I was doing. Joe would give me notes on my set. And eventually, it, the, to answer your question, why it was so cushy was that once I got my 20 minutes in front of Joe, that Joe really helped me hone in, like listen to the audience, slow down, tell more stories, all of these like little pointers. It is a cushy job because they're not there to see me. I just have to warm up the crowd and uh -huh. they immediately forget me and I can do my 20 minutes and it's you know, people who paid money to be there. They had to get a babysitter. There's, you know, these people aren't watching comedy every single day and I could just go up there and, and do my 20 minutes that I know works and I didn't have to struggle. I didn't have to do crowd work and Joe would come on and then they would forget me. So it, it was like a thing, it was an exercise for me to, to understand crowds, but after a while I kind of sat in neutral because I, I needed to challenge myself more after that. Did you do that thing where you thought, tomorrow night I'm gonna try a couple of new bits and then it comes 10 minutes before showtime yes. and you're like, oh, fuck, the place is full, like fuck it. I'm there was one time it. I did it though. Joe would always tell me like, try something new and I would always be too scared like that. But there was one time in Dallas, Texas and we were, or it was like right outside of Dallas, in between Dallas and Austin, we did this arena and there was 8,000 people there. And I went up first and, the, and people were very drunk and they were slow to walk in. The lights were still on while I'm doing my 20 minutes and Joe's car to the venue was late, so they had to make me go longer. And I wow. was like, okay, <laughs> I'm doing 40 minutes now in front of this drunk audience, and I'm already not doing well because it's just, <laughs> the, the stars were not aligning. So I start pulling out new jokes that I'd not tried yet to try to fill the time. And in the middle of Texas, I try this joke that is based off of this idea that like, Jesus is a ninja, you know, mm -hmm. that like, you know, he just, uh, you know, he can walk on water and shit, you know, or whatever and not realizing that this is a religious crowd in Texas, just booze start. Like uh, 7,000, oh. and people are starting no, yelling, just... chanting, Joe Coy, Joe uh. Coy, while I'm trying new bits, and then I try another new bit, and it's like the most specific LA traffic bit, and they're like, what the fuck is this guy talking about? Joe, I see in the corners, and they're literally booing me off stage, and <laughs> Joe is like dancing and smiling, <laughs> loving oh, every moment. Wow. And then eventually I, I get off stage, and right when I walk by Joe, he goes, that was one of the biggest bombs I've ever seen, but don't worry, they're gonna forget who you are. And then he walked out there and just murdered for two hours. <laughs> but yeah, like what the one time I tried new stuff, it just did not work. And I think it was like, they could smell the fear too, when I just mm -hmm. started shaking and telling stories I hadn't tried. But, and, and again, I forgot my training. Like I was like a bad, you know, uh, a bad, you know, trainee was like, I, I wasn't listening to the crowd. I didn't realize where I was and was telling the wrong, the yeah. wrong stuff, but. Yeah, so I never did after that. And then like, but after a while, I was like, I had to try new stuff and I couldn't do it there. If, you, if someone's paying, I don't want to ruin their night. You know, I, I want to give them a good show, especially when it's not mine. So like, I had to leave. So are you on a tour bus mainly or are you guys flying and hopping on to tour bus? Yeah, when I was on with Joe, um, it was tour bus. It was like, we would fly to a place and then we would meet um, his tour bus and we would just drive around that area from Wednesday to Sunday. And and Joe is a grinds, man. That dude works harder than anybody. And, and um, I was sleeping on a tour bus and then on a flight Wednesday through Sunday, and we would do a show every single night and just drive to the next venue. And now he's on just flights. I think he's doing all private everywhere because yeah. he's gotten the arena level. And and yeah, it was my it, and I grew up an emo kid in Iowa wanting to play music. So that was like my dream was to be on a tour bus. And and Joe let me have that. And and I loved it. It was awesome. Like I, I loved the tour bus driver. I loved seeing America. Um, I loved just sitting around with comics talking shit. That's we talked about you a lot. And it, it was great. I I agree. I mean, I, I people first off, you talk to a lot of people and they talk about a road trip is like tiring. You know, I I, I don't know what fucking everyone's a pussy, I yeah. guess, but they're like, well, you you know, you know, drive from L.A., you're going to drive to Vegas. Uh, you're going to want to rest up before the show because you're, you're going to be tired, like tired of sitting in air conditioning and <laughs> listening yeah. to Yacht Rock. Like, I'm yeah. not doing anything. Yeah. But you, it's pretty tiring to like, it's not. It's not. It, it, I like, agree. It's easy. And, and it's and, it, and there are so many people that wish they could go do to travel anywhere. I grew up around people who never left our county line in Iowa because they just couldn't even afford it, were too scared to do it, like had to go to work. Like people I grew up with never even got to go on a vacation. So like anybody that complains about traveling is like, what the fuck are you gonna do at home? Sit on your phone? Like what privilege do you have to like hate leaving your spot? 
And there's so much to see in this country. Yes. Just drive. I just drove from Monterey to Napa. You yeah. know, it's, it's all beautiful. And then you stop in some, you know, Scotts Valley in in Northern California and you find a diner oh, and you just sit in some diner that you'll never go in. Okay. Now, ever again. Yes, this is what I love about this too, is that I think that people, especially in the cities, the people who don't travel and, or if they only travel like from LA to New York, that's their traveling. Those are the people that you'll find have the middle of the country wrong. Like yes. they're like, you need to go out there and take that road trip and stop at those diners and see these people that you are judging in the middle of the country that are like all these like backwards Republican, whatever, like you don't know them. Like you'll go to those small towns, find these discoveries and find like the most beautiful people. They just, they just want to know who you are yeah. and, and they just want to like, and, and they're all mom and pop diners. They're like, I went to a, a I was on a road trip doing stand up, and we were driving through Missouri and we stopped at this really small restaurant and a family made me a tenderloin at this restaurant. And they also gave me all of these recommendations to do around town. And it was the most romantic trip I've ever taken by myself. I found my soul there, you know? And I think that uh, you start to realize you have the country wrong when you don't do what we're talking about. Well, people are generally nice, you you find out, especially in those kind of towns. Yeah. And they're helpful. And if you ask them a question, they'll, they'll give you a, a multi- Hard yeah, answer yeah, to yeah. it. You'll ask somebody how to get somewhere in LA and they'll just be like, look on your phone. You ask someone how to get somewhere in like Idaho. They'll be like, I'll take you there. Right. You know, and it's beautiful. Back. <laughs> yeah. I'll walk you there. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. It, it, it adds a lot of perspective. And, you know, I think a lot of, it's funny. No, it's kind of interesting. It just popped in my head. But yes, this crowd, the sort of New York, LA crowd who judges the country is sort of fly over country mm-hmm. and never really experiences. They're the ones that are constantly telling you to travel internationally to experience other cultures and mm-hmm. other people. And they always do that thing where it's like, you'll find that we don't have the differences. You don't, you don't, these people look different. They speak a different language, but you'll find that they love their children and they love their country and they love celebration or whatever. I would say to say, the same to them about the middle of the country. Yes, go yes, there go. and find that they're regular, nice people, yes. love their country and love their family. And on that note, whenever somebody internationally asks, like, "Oh, like you know, I want to go to America," like when I'm visiting my family in the Philippines, or like when we are touring internationally, people would be like, oh, "I want to visit America. Like, where should I go?" And everyone's like, "I want to, I want to see it. like New York City." I'm like, "Go to Big Sky, Montana." That's yeah. America. Go see America. Like, don't go see this place, these places that wish they were London, you know, like right. to that same, like, and I, I think that that is something that we need to celebrate more and just to see, like, there's so many places I haven't been that I would rather go to first just to know what America is like before I go to like Istanbul, you know, like, cause I don't know. I've never been to like Massachusetts. For instance, I've never been to Massachusetts and I wouldn't want to go to Boston. I want to go to the like working class people on like the, the sea border that are fishing out there. Like, and yeah. I want to see that America. I've never seen it. And that's romantic to me. I go to Lowell. What's yeah, that? go to Lowell. Yeah. Lowell. What's that? It's like a, I don't know. We, when I went to Massachusetts, we are, are on that road trip. I went on Adam with a school bus. Our yeah. bus broke down in Lowell, Massachusetts. And these guys, and we were trying to fix it in a gas station. These guys come up and they're like, Hey, where are you guys from? And we say we're from Orange County. Mm-hmm. And this is when the OC was at mm-hmm. like the height of its popularity. So they go, mm-hmm. oh, OC, like that TV show? Mm-hmm. And he's like, um, so they were just pumped that we were from Orange County. Not even like, we're yeah. not even part of the TV show. They're just like, oh, you're from the, where that TV show goes. So they call their wives like, you're not going to believe who's here. They're <laughs> yeah. from the OC. And one of the guys happened to be a bus mechanic. He's like, he towed us back to their house. They threw a party for us, a barbecue, just because our bus broke down at a gas station. Yeah. And we were from Orange County. That's something that's interesting. Too. I think people in the middle of the country, too, are just pumped more. There's yeah. like a lot less nihilism there. And I yes. think that like th- to that same point, like I think where I grew up too, I grew up in a small town, like 8,000 people. And like if there was be- because you don't have access to anything, what you have is the most sacred thing. So like, you know, when you can't just go to like, you know, a concert at night and you're just drinking with your friends and they bring a cousin over and the cousins from Minneapolis. Right. That's the coolest person I've ever met just because they're from Minneapolis. Yeah. And like. That is so earnest and real. And like it's 
And I think that's why those people are so funny. I think that's like to bring it all back around again. I think that's why that earnesty is so funny is that like it's their curiosity that still exists in the middle of the country. And earnesty. Yeah. <laughs> Earnest and honesty. Yeah. 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 <laughs> we, we made a hot pot. Yeah. Now. We're killing it, guys. We're geniuses. <laughs> I, you know, that it struck me. I grew up in the San Fernando Valley and everything here is built like between 19... 19- 71 and 1987, you know, like, is this a little window? And I remember Dr. Drew and I were playing a place, some college in Massachusetts, out of town, and we're driving, and the driver, he goes, he goes, this is the newer side of town. Like, these are newer houses we're just traveling through. And they were like, the most of these things were built in, like, 1750 <laughs> to, like, 1810 or something. I was like, wow, that's new <laughs> for you? That's new. Built 200 years yeah. ago was considered new for, for this guy. Whereas from if you're from the San Fernando Valley, literally nothing existed before 1962. Yeah. Have you ever been to Dubai? No. We, I went to Dubai with Joe, and there's old Dubai and new Dubai, and old Dubai is from 2010. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, <laughs> yo, <laughs> the amount of money that you have to have to have old Dubai be 10 years, like, that's that's a new car to me. A 2010 Corolla, yes. brand new to me. <laughs> that's so crazy. And, and I, I, like, and that's the other thing, too, is just, like, uh, uh, that is so cool to be able to, like, I don't think anybody knows any history in LA. Like if I asked anybody when this building was built, nobody knows. Right. Nobody knows. But then like every like my house in Iowa, like my parents know when it was built, you know, and the people before that, like it's just so like, I miss that like connection to the the art of where it's from. Yeah, there's lots to see, lots to experience yeah. and uh don't nap on the road trip. Yeah. I fucking love a road trip. Agreed. Um, um, oh, yes. um, Andrew. So you're you're obviously in a in a bunch of movies, and t- you have you're in Platonic, which is like the new Apple TV show, the big the big hit show, and the Bear, yeah. obviously huge huge show too. Um, but I want to know in in uh, contrast to all the things you've been in, you're also the first face I saw at Target <laughs> for like two years. <laughs> yeah. Dude. Or what was that? You know what's so funny about that is that I get more rec- I get more. That's like my biggest credit. He had a poster <laughs> on, on the entrance door of every Target. Every really? Target. His face. Yeah. It's like a, the now hiring poster for Target <laughs> is a photo of me. Really? <laughs> and it's like I did that in 2017 because I couldn't afford rent and I went to an open casting call. And I, they just took pictures of me. And then the next year, all of a sudden, my photo was in every Target in America. And I got paid maybe like $1,000 for that. And that was like it. And oh. then like it got me my rent for the month. But like it was uh, – and it was – and I'm so grateful for it actually. Like I thought it was so funny. I In the picture, I'm wearing like all red. I'm wearing glasses. Um, when I took the picture – I wasn't wearing glasses or red at all. That was all photoshopped in there. Really? There it is, baby. There you are. We're hiring. Yes. I saw every time I walked into Target, like, oh, there's Andrew. Yeah. Look at that guy. I look so old. (laughs) I think they whitened my skin a little bit, too. I look like a ghost a little bit, you know? But there's, like, something funny about it because I kind of look like a turtle. Like, it's weird. That photo... (laughs) I get m- I get more text messages congratulating me for that than anything I've e- than my birthday. <laughs> I get more congratulations for that. I don't know why we need a picture. I, we're hiring is enough. Yeah. Meaning, if I'm looking for a job, I'll fill out an application. You don't think that this is the phone? Fo- I, I, I feel this like is not a condemnation. This doesn't of make your you want to hire. I, I, I applied. I am <laughs> saying there are two people that are passing that poster. And only two <laughs> types. One needs a job. The other's gainfully employed. Yeah. Don't, other one Your likeness mask. is not going to sway either yeah. one to go either direction. Yeah, this white Filipino man is not going to say it. It's like I, I came in to get. Uh, yeah. some detergent, but after seeing the guy in the horn rim glasses, I think I may turn around and put in an app, even though I run Nabisco. Like, I have a very lucrative six-figure job, but after seeing this guy... I feel like the period makes it really sad, too. Like, we're hiring. It's really, it's a bummer. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a harsh statement. I'm, I'm happy for this thing. I, it's, it's honestly my favorite, and it's been there for three years. They're still there. I don't know if they're ever going to get rid of it. <laughs> 
Well, we'll take ourselves a quick break. We'll do the uh, news. Andrew will hang out, and we'll uh, get into that right after this. Well, I'll tell you about Tommy John. Saunas are great, but not in your pants this summer. Save the sweat and keep it cool down there with Tommy John underwear. When you wear Tommy John, you're so much more comfortable. You do everything better. Dozens of comfort innovations. Breathable, lightweight, moisture-wicking fabric with four times the stretch of competing brands. It'll keep you seven degrees cooler than cotton. I'm wearing mine right now. I wouldn't dream of leaving my house without them on. Over 20 million pairs sold and thousands of five-star reviews. Tommy John doesn't have customers. They have fanatics, and I'm one of them. Even the stuff that's kind of a Tommy John knockoff, you will not like once you get into Tommy John. It is the best pair you'll ever wear. Or it's free. Guaranteed. It's Tommy John, right, Dawson? Keep cool and comfortable this 4th of July with Tommy John. Get 25% off site-wide at TommyJohn.com slash Adam. 25% off at TommyJohn.com slash Adam. See site for details. In celebration of Jim Carolla's upcoming 92nd birthday, here's a list of 92 things Jim Carolla has never done. Number 78, been on a ladder that was taller than six feet. Just one of 92 things Jim Carolla has never done. Let's get back to the Adam Carolla Show. Well, comedian and director and writer and actor, Andrew Lopez is hanging out with us. Uh, Mark Pellington is going to join us too. He's a director. He's done a lot of cool, cool videos, music videos from back in the day and movies, things like that. We'll get into that with him. Max Paz got some news. Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll kick this one off with a story out of Iowa. Mm. Do you know the name Chris Gloninger? Gloninger? No, but I'm probably one degree separate. It's such you a probably, small place. You probably know him personally. Just know, yeah, so <laughs> meteorologist. He's a 18-year oh. career um, working for Iowa. But he has quit after receiving uh, some death threats over his climate coverage because he's been mm. pushing like the climate crisis. He's mm. been working with other stations. Um, doing that as well, but he, he after receiving a few death threats, it had he says that it has resulted in PTSD, in addition to family health issues. So he decided to uh, begin a new journey, and um, and I have some of the messages he got if you want to hear them. Yeah. All right. So it, it really just all came basically from one guy, one 63 year old resident. You can't quit based on one, one guy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. But he posted some of the some of the screenshots, and it was mainly one one guy. And I oh, guess no. here here are some of them. Then I guess it got more menacing later. But one is a quote: "What's your home address? We conservative Iowans would like to give you an Iowan welcome you will never forget. Go eat and drown from the ice cap melting, you dumb fuck." Also, quote, I don't want your worthless weather forecast because you're an idiot. But someone else texted me and said, you are still an idiot. So go the hell <laughs> back to where you came from, douchebag. And These uh, are mildly threatening and amusing, yeah, but, exactly. I, but I don't know if it's a reason so, to quit. I know. I guess it got, and then he actually sent some real death threats. And then some oh, police no. eventually found the man responsible for the emails. His name's Danny Hancock, 63-year-old Iowa resident. Uh, he was issued a $150 fine. Mm-hmm. Things are cheap in Iowa. Yeah, exactly. And um, and yeah, so the me- the meter at all. You drive in the Diamond Lane without two passengers in LA, and it's four hundred eighty six dollars. <laughs> but you move to Iowa and threaten yeah, someone's yeah. life, and it's one hundred fifty bucks, bucks. Buy a house for two hundred thousand dollars. Jeez. <laughs> yeah. But the the weatherman said the slew of harassment left him unable to sleep, even after oh, no. uh, Hancock was found. He the needs to- a CPAP. He does. Yeah. <laughs> the toll of the threats, as well as some happenings with his family, left him struggling. So he oh. said he's going to quote devote his uh, full time efforts to finding sustainable solutions and fostering wow. positive change. I mean, right there, that story right there is a good amalgamation of what Iowa is. The two extremes, huh? Yeah. Really? The two extreme sides. You know, here's, here's what I would say about that. Um, in terms of all the climate change and all the stuff that, that's going on out there. And then this guy, he can't sleep at night because he's got a guy threatening him, essentially. Um, Telling a bunch of 10-year-old kids that the world's going to be over before they graduate from high school (laughs) will also fuck with one's mind as well, assholes. Mm -hmm. It Mm -hmm. fucks up kids to tell them it's not – they're not going to have a planet to live on on their 25th birthday. Now, you always have to kind of walk a – 
a tightrope here, which is like, should we be making positive changes to save the environment, whatever? Yes. Look no further than me. I, w- I wouldn't even throw away a sandwich and a salad and a bag of <laughs> chips because that's good energy. Yeah. That was uh, soil that was fertilized and trucks that drove it out from the from the heartland and whatever, and I will not waste it. So yep. I hate waste. I shut every light. I recycle everything I can recycle. I do everything I can do. But freaking kids out by announcing every eight years, this is it, will fuck with the collective psyche of the world. Yeah. Like, yeah. And you guys are young. I heard this shit in the 70s. I had a mom who was telling us about, back then it was the ice age. Now it's Mm -hmm. global warming. It'll shift all over the place. Mm -hmm. But we're going to be living underground. We're going to be out of fossil fuels. There's not going to be any food to eat. When you hear that shit in your nine, it fucks you up. I'm like, I literally sat there going, oh, I'm never going to be able to drive a car. And I want to drive a car, but we're going to be out. Yeah, of yeah, everything that propels. They weren't really electric cars. weren't a, They weren't in the conversation back then. But yes, I would make the same argument with him. Go yeah. ahead and be responsible. But if you're preaching doom and gloom, then you're ruining the psyche of a whole yeah, bunch of yeah, fucking yeah. kids. There's a whole bunch of kids that don't even want to have kids yeah. anymore because they're like, fuck it. Well, yeah, it's interesting. It's like, yeah, you said it earlier, too. It's like how there's a time and place and a way to give the information out in a way if they're. You, there's a way that he's probably doing that. It also sounds like a death yeah. threat to other people. He's doing, you know, he's like, doing he's Jesus like, jokes. Basically. Yeah, yeah. But I agree with you. I totally agree with you. And I think that there's um there's a thing that uh it feels like that he was doing it on the news. It sounds like which doesn't seem like the time and place if yeah. you're just telling the weather uh, yes. to to do that. Agreed. Yes. <laughs> so it's like read the room, maybe. Yeah. Adam, you've received death threats before, right? Some of them from yeah. from from our our people. Yeah, Filipinos. Ooh, <laughs> do they do they phase you at all? Uh, no, not not really. But you guys are amongst the most active uh, community in terms oh, of yeah. death threats. Right? Really? That's yeah, John Stewart told me. <laughs> like, what? I was like, now you tell me. He's like, hey, yeah, don't fuck with the Filipinos. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know. It's not that they're killers. It's yeah. that they don't have anything else to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah, know, yeah, as yeah. a community. You know yeah. what I mean? So it's fun. Yeah, we love each other it's a, it's yeah. more of a time yeah. killer than it is yeah. a white guy yeah, we killer. We something to do. Yeah. There's a. Has has any of them ever felt real? I I don't know what feels real. Like I I don't know really what's real and what's not real. We had death threats when I did Love Line on on MTV. Mm. Um, bomb planted. You know they're going to plant bombs. Yeah, me and Drew got death threats from uh, MTV days. And there I, there was an episode or two where like the cops followed me home. Like I had the yeah, escort. escort yeah. Um, yeah, it's a flawed premise because I was living alone and I was living in this old house from the 20s up in the Hollywood Hills, like under the Hollywood sign. It was just an old dark house, like up up on top of a hill. I had to walk up a whole bunch of stairs and they were getting death threats at the studio. And, and so they were like, well, we're going to have the cops drop you off at your house or follow you to your house. And I was like, oh, okay. And then we got to my house and then the cops just peeled off and went <laughs> home. But the house is pitch black. It's dark. I left at 10 in the morning. It's like nine at night now. Yeah. And now I'm going to go walk into my dark house and be attacked <laughs> while the cops are driving down the hill. I was like, I mean, I kind of, I appreciate what you're doing, but yeah. the, the danger yeah. It's not from Hollywood Center Studios <laughs> to my house. I mean, unless there's some kind of crazy road rage involved. Yeah. I, I don't that the safest part of this journey is going to be from here to my house. It's when I get yeah. to my house, then what Escort awaits me. me. In, yes. Yes. Come search the house. <laughs> but they just escorted me. And then That's when I would cool. do Loveline, the TV show, uh, the radio show, sorry, we had weirdos like waiting yeah. in the parking lot. Do you find in, a while. in in time, if you got a death threat back in the day or the death threat now, one felt more serious because of like how society I changed? never paid it. <clears throat> I never pay any attention to it yeah. one way or the other. I was just like, well, it's going to happen or it's not. Um, but at some point with what happened with Loveline, the radio show is... It was at, um, it was in Culver City. 
Culver City was really run down and dicey, you know, circa 1997. There was no, nothing there. Mm -hmm. there. There wasn't, they built it up since, but it was dark and weird and quiet. Mm -hmm. And the parking lot was dark. And, and sometimes there'd be weirdos just s sitting in the car, just <laughs> in the parking lot. And you just walk out and it'd be midnight and there was nobody there. And they knew when you're walking out of, yeah. the, of the building and there was no gate or security or or anything. And so I told them, uh, you guys need to have security. Um, not so much for me, but like Kathy Griffin would be walking out to her car yeah. at 1207 on a Wednesday <laughs> night in the dark Culver City. She parked on the street like yeah. you need to escort her to the to the car and they never provided uh, they they tech they took their time <clears throat> so i said look here's the hard out for security yeah you have two weeks if, if i pull up and i don't see a security guard standing by the back door which everyone knew was right in the parking lot and there was no security anywhere I said, if I if, if we get to two weeks and I pull up and I don't see a guard sitting there, I'm not phoning anybody. I'm not coming in. I'm not doing anything. I'm just putting my car in reverse and I'm going home, yeah. which I did yeah, you know, well. because they weren't there. And then eventually they, they got a security guard and then the security guard fell asleep. Of course. And he needed a CPAP machine <laughs> yeah. as bad as Joe Coy. <laughs> and so he was in the lobby on the front sofa and he just passed out. He'd be sawing <laughs> logs, right? So then I thought it'd be funny if we got a microphone and a 20 foot cord and we plugged it in and I walked it out there and quietly <laughs> set it down next to him so we could hear him snoring on the air. <laughs> and, and we did. And I thought it was funny, but then his boss heard him snoring on the air. Oh, no. And uh, then he got fired. Yeah, every wow. criminal is like, we can definitely break into that one. That's yeah, <laughs> but all he had to do was stay up between 10 and midnight. Yeah. It wasn't that tall an order. Yeah. But he went to bed. But you didn't get, get freaked out. Like, like at the end of Joker, Kimmel hates that scene um, where, uh, I mean, spoiler alert, Joker kills the... the oh, I didn't see it. Well, <laughs> yeah. Uh, the end of talk radio did that oh, freak yeah. you out at all and having people wait outside of your station no i you know i i was assaulted by my friends very frequently mm. and and often very violently assaulted by my friends constantly forever always you mean like beat the shit out of you like what do you, we what? we played in a very very rough very rough way, mm -hmm. very rough way, and did lots of horrible things to each other for ex an extended period of time. So I never had thoughts about people putting their hands on me mm -hmm. or coming up to me or grabbing me or it just didn't bother me because I grew up in an environment where that's all we did. So yeah. All we did was try to kill each other, essentially, mm -hmm. not not. Not with a balled up fist, but anything short yeah. of a balled up fist. Yeah. That's how we rolled. And these guys were super tough and super aggressive. So I was like, no one's going to outdo my fucked up friends. So it never bothered me. I never, yeah, you were I never prepped. thought it about like, it. I actually think that's why Jackass worked the way it did back then. Because I grew up the same. Like, it was just like there was, you know. You grew up with Ross. <laughs> yeah, I grew up with Ross beating the shit out of me in my basement. But mm -hmm. it's, yeah, I, I totally agree. I But now it's weird because now I feel like now that I've been living in Los Angeles for like a lot, like 10 years, I am like a, a bitch now. <laughs> like, I'll walk out of a place at night and like hold my pen like this in my <laughs> hand. While, Ready. Yeah, this is my security. But like, yeah, I, I, I get that. Do you find that? I also think that the Discord is weird now because back then people would show up or write a letter with a death threat, mm -hmm. and that meant they like I've never written a letter in like fifteen years. That must mean they mean it. But yeah, it like now, yeah, now you could just do it on your phone. It's like this is bullshit. Like this person's not <laughs> going to do anything. Yeah, the electronic yeah. death threat isn't as effective yeah. anymore. A YouTube comment doesn't hurt as much. I I think people should be you know I assess situations and people and like don't get out of the car here drive mm -hmm. a little further or, or you know i wouldn't want to you know i don't like going to a gas station in the middle of the night and filling up like yeah. i would go i'll do it in the daylight hours tomorrow mm -hmm. you know just a little stuff that mitigates your chances of being involved with with something but 
you know, like road rage shit. Like you're going to really honk at someone and flick them off and stuff. Who knows if they got a gun? Who knows what kind of day they had? You know, like there's a little mitigating things like that. But no, I've I've definitely had death threats and I I just didn't pay that much attention to them. I'm a I'm a flight guy when it's fight or flight. I'm like, I'm running. I'm yeah. just going. I don't want to deal with this. It's life's too short for me to fight with somebody because I'm gonna lose. Probably <laughs> it's all I'm out. <laughs> yeah, I agree. <laughs> all right. Well, I'm um, speaking of being careful. Uh, psychologists warn that it's actually a major red flag if you relax by enjoying true crime stories. Mm. So yeah, because um, so there's a psychologist, Dr. Therma Bryant. She's she's gone on record saying that if trauma feels familiar to you then that's probably a sign that you may benefit from counseling. The idea of relaxing before you go to sleep is to watch three episodes of like Law and Order or Dahmer or something. She says, I would encourage you to think about why trauma is relaxing because it's harm, crime, violation, attacks, things like that. Listen, mm. I I agree. It it we've talked about it. The, the true crime thing us. is not mm. healthy. No, it isn't. Mm. And we've we've turned it into some sort of pastime. But you're like pastime are stories about fourteen year olds being abducted and then raped and dismembered in the woods and shit. It's like why is that something that's interesting? Yeah. To you, no, thank you. And yeah. and I don't. It doesn't feel leisurely. <laughs> it doesn't feel like a way to unwind. And it feels sort of. I, I I also feel like it's intrusive. Like mm. when they go, they took the 15 year old, she was raped repeatedly and then, you know, chained it to a, to a water heater in the basement and then raped again. It's like, God, this is a person. Yeah. Like, yeah. I don't need to know all the intimacies of their horrible abduction yeah. and you think in this, life. This you person's know? family or estate wants it being told uh, yes. in such a way yeah. either. Like, yeah, it's really weird. I also think that it's strange because it, they, they also have to make it longer than it. Like I could read the Wikipedia and it'd be done in five minutes, yes. but they mm-hmm. found ways to do like reenactments. It's it's almost become like porn to them. Like I want to see how bad I yeah. can actually make this. Yeah, you cliffhangers. Know? Yeah, like I I went after Joe. What's his name? Who's the Girls Gone Wild guy? Joe. Damn it. We'll come up with him, but. Before Joe Francis. Joe Francis. Mm. Before Joe Francis was Girls Gone Wild, he was the faces of death guy. <laughs> and they they would run these commercials in the middle of the night, uh, just a compilation of people fucking getting killed yeah. horribly, right? And he went to USC and I remember yelling about him on Loveline a million times and at some point. I, I can't recall, but I challenged him to a debate or something. He called it and I started yelling at him or something. Yeah. But there would be these commercials like in the middle of the night that you would buy these compilation tapes of people being obliterated by like commuter uh, trains and shit. And they'd, like, they'd show some woman. It was usually out of like, it was always out of some European country yeah. or something. But it was like, it would just lights up on the commercial It'd be like a 28-year-old woman walking and like looking at her phone or looking at a piece of paper. And it was clearly a surveillance camera, like at the train station or something. And they just show her walking in a commuter train, like they cut, right? And I'd be like, I'd be like, who wants to see that? What the fuck do I have to see that for? Like, number one. Number two. That woman left behind yeah. three kids and a fucking grieving yes. husband and a and a mom and do you think uh, they want to turn on the fucking uh, TV and see their daughter? Yeah, doing so weird this? to also be what like, what the fuck is wrong yeah, with everybody? To see that and be like, now back to Frasier. And yeah, it's like, that's right. What the fuck? <laughs> right. I hate that too because I I that yeah like I feel that with World Star like the World Star fight compilations like the, it, like you'll see somebody get knocked out and hit his head on the surface and you're like and then it cuts out and you're like. A person probably died. I feel the and same way. Like, I hate this, and I. But and and the other thing that's weird about it, like like okay, like even the submarine last yeah. week, right? Like the weird thing that I don't understand is like I I don't I wasn't down with all the jokes about the submarine, but some of the memes and stuff was funny. So if you can find a way to make it funny, I'll find the way to find the empathy for it, right? Right. But if it's just to watch it to like laugh at it or to enjoy it, which is what some of those like true crime docs are, I don't get that. Yeah, yeah they sold the movie rights to that. Yeah, like, before before we even found out what happened. It, it's weird. It, it also feels 
like it's a little window into your soul. You know, okay. like when people start going, see, you can have all the money in the world and mm-hmm. still uh, die in a sub implosion. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, I right, get it. You're not successful. Yeah. And yeah. it's just schadenfreude and you're happy that That's rich a, people yeah. are, yeah. you know, but it's it's a little too telling about yes. you. Yeah, and, yeah. and all the, and, and women like to wring their hands and, you know, they always start every one of these stories that Oprah First words, like, if it can happen here, it can happen anywhere. And then all mm. the dumb yentas watching go, I live anywhere. Oh, fuck. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. If, if you're I'm alive, <laughs> you're somewhere, yeah, which yeah. is anywhere. I'm going to be on a submarine uh, next. <laughs> yes, that could be me. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. You know, take it to another level. It's like, I, there was this weird thing where, like, you know, obviously, like, people are online, you know, sexualizing this you know childlike look right like people like dressing like babies and stuff and then there's like you know but then you'll people are celebrating tv shows where like high schoolers are doing drugs and like having sex and i'm like isn't this the same thing as the thing that we should so like whenever i hear somebody like a show where it's like 16 year olds are naked and fucking and they're like that's my favorite show i'm like yeah. Wait a minute. What is what are, what are you into? Flag, yeah. yeah. But they like celebrate those shows as yes. if it's not weird. Like, I, I agree. And then you got the guy, you know, down the street who's getting busted because of a computer filled yeah. with kitty porn, which is underage people having sex, which you would definitely not condone. You just want to see a depiction of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's not the same. I'm not into that. Yeah. I am yeah. into this, yeah. Yeah. which is a well lit yeah. version of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They're like, that actor's not 16, she's 18, okay? (laughs) But tell my cock and balls that. (laughs) Yeah, I I get it. Yeah, I don't... I, I'm with you. It's weird. It's weird. And but so yeah, like I, the face is a death thing. I'd never heard of it. And also, weirdly, that was at a time when it was on VHS, probably right. Yeah. So they were re like actively rewinding that tape to watch it. Fucking weird. That That's was so a Joe weird. Joe Francis before. Pretty sure before he got into the Girls Gone Wild thing. Is true crime like the like the new urban legend, but now we, we actually have proof because remember urban legends like I remember people tell me, oh, when you're at a gas station, like feel the seat behind your seat because mm. if you leave your car to go pay for it, somebody probably Somebody's ran in and like yeah, and hit, laying down yeah, there. laying down ready to ready to choke you out or stab you or things like there are all these things that you would hear about that would kind of change the way you lived your life. Mm-hmm. I I think that women especially to, to a lesser degree, men, but women especially have a certain amount of hard drive space in their brain to worry about the worst case scenario. Mm. And in every moment in history before now, they were correct because you would be killed by a staph infection. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, if you got tetanus, you would be killed. You know what I mean? Like if you were out and you're dealing with some farm equipment and it was rusty and you cut yourself, your 12 year old could die <laughs> of that cut from the mm-hmm. rusty farm equipment. Right. So it's like they were right for moms to worry back in the day because there would be cougars and bobcats and grizzly bears and, but you know, walk to the well at night could mean death, right? Mm -hmm. Then we got all gentrified and we got all air conditioned and everything has been wiped down with Purell and Lysol and everyone. And and there's none of that anymore. Mm -hmm. Every car has an airbag Mm -hmm. and a crumple zone. Everyone is fully insured and fully vaccinated, but there's still that part of their brain and it needs to be satiated. It needs to be fed. Mm. And instead of going, well, I guess we're out of problems. Let's focus on something real. They go, no, this is a part of my brain that still needs to be fed as if it was 300 years ago and we needed clean drinking water. Mm. Otherwise, the kid would get dysentery and never recover. Yeah. Then watch planet but- Earth. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Come on. I don't know. I'm, I must be a woman then because I'm scared of everything. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm walking into my car like this in daylight. <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 I'm a hypochondriac, so I'm scared of all of those things. Like, and so I, I have a hard drive. Like, and I, and it's, and it, I do feel that it's a waste of my space to be worrying because nothing's ever happened. Mm-hmm. So, like for me, like I, I, I definitely probably should go to therapy about why I'm worried about all these things. I, I think it's almost impossible 
to be young and to be inundated with crazy fucking information constantly mm-hmm. and not be fearful. Yeah, I, I was just mm-hmm. reading an article and, you know, and, and by the way, the, the LA Times, New York Times, CNN, so they're all fear based. All, all news is, is fear based. And this was just an article in the LA Times where they're like, your gas stove could be causing more problems than secondhand smoke, you know, deadlier, you know, cooking indoors, deadlier than secondhand smoke, benzene, Mm -hmm. high levels of benzene are created when, you know, and it's always like, okay, one more fucking thing (laughs) to worry about. Now, if you use your head, everyone grew up in a house with a gas stove whose mom used it 24 seven, none of us have benzene poisoning, (laughs) but 10 minutes ago the the LA times is explaining there's one more thing. You have to know what's bullshit. Yeah. Women, I have women say to me all the time, you got to get rid of those water bottles with the small mouth openings because bacteria, and I go, fuck it. Just fuck right off. <laughs> I, I don't care. And they go, I read an article that says high levels of bacteria, but bacteria in these, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah this yeah, salad's yeah. on the table over there. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, I just okay. decided yeah, like I just I, ate a stranger salad, yeah. and I may toss it later. <laughs> I just decided it like I don't care. I'm yeah, like I don't even know. Have to do. I don't know. I don't read. I don't care. Like <laughs> I, it's like I'll, somebody told me that McDonald's was unhealthy. It tastes amazing. Scientists made it to me, and I love it. <laughs> COVID <laughs> came around. I was like, I'm either getting it or I'm not getting it. There's nothing mm-hmm. I'm going to do to prevent it one way Weirdly, or the other. Like, and the, the only thing that it taught me is that I should be living more. Like, Good. you know what I mean? Like, you after, don't need therapy. Yeah, yeah. After all that, yeah, exactly. After that, I'm like, you know what? You need a kayak. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, I need a kayak and a road trip. Let's I'll go. I'll bet you, you can undo. Uh, years of therapy could be undone by one, one kayak. kayak. The same. If you fucking hit that kayak early yeah, and often, yeah. you'd be much more yeah. tuned up. You get a kayak and a CPAP, and your life is yep. good, dog. <laughs> well rested and knowing the world. CPAP kayak. <laughs> yeah, CPAP kayak. Is Joe Francis face as a death guy or not? I'm not Somebody. finding anything. Or what did he do before? Banned from television. Banned, Banned from, from television. television. Well, I that's what those. I'm they show like yeah. car accidents and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. I that's a, but that's what I'm it's saying. It's just, it's it's accident. It's not. I'm watching a commercial on TV for something that can't be shown on TV, and you're just showing yeah. me the fucking highlights where yeah. people are being killed. I would I argue enjoy. Yeah. it's not fully banned. <laughs> <laughs> Kitty porn is totally yeah. banned. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we can't run yeah. spots for yeah. it. He was one year away from doing that. I feel it should like. be called kind of banned from TV. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like you can't show cigarette yeah, commercials. Yeah. Those are banned yeah, yeah, yeah. from TV. <laughs> but should have been you're banned. Calling this banned from yeah. TV, but I'm watching a commercial for it yeah. on TV. <laughs> an asterisk on that title. <laughs> Did he end up going to jail? Is that what happened to him? I think, I think right? He, so, yeah, something I think about the girls gone so, yeah, wild stuff, right? Something. I feel like there was a lot of those, all those cast, even like years later, like the, those casting porn, you like uh, on Pornhub and stuff, all those people ended up going to jail, like, because it was like, they're all in the same kind of boat of just like taking advantage of people and making money. It's so crazy. that like, I don't, I don't know if he's currently incarcerated, but I would hire him. Yeah. Like that kid's got a motor. Yeah. I mean, he was doing band from TV, like out of college. Yeah. Like he was running commercials on late night TV with a compilation of clearable death clips from around the country, <laughs> I mean, around the some, world. They were captivating. And and I was fucking coming home from Love Line at 1230 at night and turn on the yes. TV. Like, band from TV. Oh, boy. <laughs> Now I'm not going to be able to beat off because this chick yeah, just yeah. bought it by, with a German commuter train. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really funny. Yeah, you're, you're wanting to jerk off to Girls Gone Wild and then all of a sudden you see somebody get decapitated. And you're yeah. like, this guy's got a model. Well, Shot I mean, to one. be fair to him, he evolved <laughs> yeah. into Girls Gone Wild because he started with the band. I swear to God, he was in college or something. I mean, that's crazy. he can't be 50. I was watching band from TV commercials in like 1999. He's exactly 50. He's ex- whoa, I said he can't be 50, dude. douche. <laughs> of all the <laughs> ages. Yeah. I said he can't. Do you hear me? Were, was that the same dude? Because there was also like those bum fight tapes. Do you That's remember a different the guy. different guy? Yeah. That was crazy too, that that was a thing. He was something with Paris Hilton or something, something. Yeah. I remember he went on Dr. Too. Phil and he dressed exactly as Dr. Phil and even cut his hair in like Dr. Phil's haircut. Just to, just That's to Adam Dr. Ray. 
<laughs> oh, that, that might have been Adam Ray. Yeah, there. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's this really like famous video where he did that, just, and he did it to call out Doctor Phil, and Doctor Phil like in like two minutes kicked him off, kicked him off the Damn. show. Damn. So is he out? Is he went to prison? I think he went to jail or jail. Um, definitely out now. Out. Well, jail's just before prison, right? But doesn't that? So he ended up getting banned from TV. They ended yeah. up banning him. Is he somewhere? Where is he? He's, you know what? He's got to be on one of those islands they run Golden Palace Gambling dot com <laughs> from, or something. Yeah. He's got to be in one of those places mm-hmm. we don't have an extradition treaty mm-hmm. with that don't pay federal yeah. taxes yes. or something like. Yeah. He's, he seems like one he's got to be sure. on one of those gambling yes. islands because people like that don't stop. They're gonna no. find the next thing that is like disrupting whatever. What year was banned from TV? When did that first start? Had to be in the Damn. 2000 or something. Those girls gone wild infomercials, infomercials though. Those are those are a big part of my yeah. job. They just yeah. got like 30 minute spots oh, just that, to yeah. sell Changed. this tape. Oh, yeah. if I hear that steel drum 1998. and yeah. the street Changed lights me. are on, I fucking get a boner. <laughs> yes, like I, hear, I just hear yeah. it was in a Disney yes. movie. <laughs> <Lights> <laughs> I hear steel drum, I start getting a boner. Yeah. <laughs> It's all it took. It's all, yeah, it's all it took. Then. Turn on the street <laughs> lights. You can't go to Jamaica. That's right. I, yeah. I remember the first one I ended up getting. We stole it from some like adult bookstore, but it was the Snoop Dogg one. Oh, Snoop yeah. Snoop Dogg. Yeah, Doggy Wild, a Doggy <laughs> Style. <laughs> And it would, I, I remember, this is so fucked up. I remember jerking off to it. And then every time I was like getting close, Snoop Dogg would pop up. And I'm like, oh, oh yeah. got me. <laughs> 1998 was. Good year. Was banned from TV, right? Yeah, it would have been like three years after he was uh, done with college. Yeah, wow. so I would come home from Loveline. They would run late night, you know, turn on the TV. And there was the band wow. from TV. And I was like, who the fuck is doing this? And then I found out it was him. And then I found out, I think he went to USC and then he went on to do Girls Gone Wild or whatever. And now he's where? Is he living on an island somewhere? Probation, something, yeah. owes the IRS. Yeah. Uh, what was the guys think, You guys want to bet? Do you think he's doing all right? I bet he is. I wouldn't bet against that kid. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I, there's, cert- there's certain guys that they got a motor. Yeah. Yeah. on them you can disagree with a lot of it but the motor yeah they're cockroaches that you right. can't kill them you can't kill them can't he's doing something yeah. let me know when you guys want to know uh, let's hear it okay so as of december 2022 francis is a fugitive living in mexico with two arrest warrants open in the u.s wow what is he a fugitive for do we know unclear let me see wow banned from telemundo <laughs> 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 wow <laughs> but i'll bet he's fucking drinking I mean, a margarita yeah, right I mean, now I mean, it seems like he's fine. Right? yeah yeah he's in paradise yeah man. yes wow he's living a much better life than us he's also somebody that seems like the law enforcement he'd be friends with them you know oh, like, yeah. yeah he's like in with them he's never gonna get caught oh over in mexico yeah, yeah. yeah. we're never bringing him back <laughs> all right uh let's see mark pellington uh, director is going to uh, come in here. It's got a really cool movie out called Survive. Also did tons of videos, YouTube and, uh, uh, sorry, YouTube, I should say, Pearl Jam. Uh, did Jeremy, won a MTV and Billboard Awards for uh, Jeremy. We all love video. that vid. Uh, let's see, Andrew Lopez. Hey, uh, sorry, Platonic is the name of the series, and that is out. So Ju- good, yeah. July seventh. It Star is Seth funny. Rogan. Bruce yeah, Bruce 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 always Nick great. Stoller. Nicholas Stoller, yeah, yeah, and uh, the Bear as well, streaming on Hulu. John Live Chris dates. Store. Andrew Lopez dot me dot me. Andrew, great to see you, my friend. This is on honor, seriously, man. I, I appreciate everything you've done for comedy, so I appreciate well, you, man. Thank you, yeah. and Chris. Hey, salama. We'll talk to Mark <laughs> right after this. The professional parts people at O'Reilly Auto Parts are in the business of keeping your car on the road. They offer friendly, helpful service and the parts knowledge you need for your maintenance and repairs. The team at O'Reilly Auto Parts can test your battery for free in or out of the car. If it needs to be replaced, they'll help you find the right battery for your vehicle. If your check engine light is on, O'Reilly Auto Parts will scan it and retrieve your trouble codes for free. If needed, they'll even refer you to a repair shop. 
When you're a do-it-yourselfer and need a specialty tool to finish the job, stop by O'Reilly Auto Parts and ask about their loaner tool program. Simply pay a refundable deposit and borrow the right tool. Then get your deposit back when it's returned. Ready for some new wiper blades? The professional parts people at O'Reilly Auto Parts will help you pick out just what you need for your car and will even install them for you for free. O'Reilly Auto Parts has thousands of quality parts and accessories in stock that you might need to keep your vehicle running at its best. Place your order online at O'Reilly Auto Parts and then pick it up at your local store. You can even have your order shipped directly to your doorstep, giving you the freedom of shopping on your schedule. Stop by O'Reilly Auto Parts today or visit O'ReillyAuto.com. Let me tell you about Turo Innovative. It's the world's largest car sharing marketplace with Turo. You can book any car you want, wherever you want, from a community of local hosts. Browse a huge selection of vehicles for just about any occasion or budget. Book an SUV or minivan for a family road trip, a pickup truck for some errands, or even test drive an EV. Every trip is backed by liability insurance. Terms, conditions, and exclusions apply. Find your drive. Forget your boring rental cars at Turo, T-U-R-O dot com. It's time for Nicaraguan Name That Movie with Adam's buddy, Oswaldo. See if you can guess which movie this famous line is from. The one constant throw all the year, Ray Ash Ben Baseball. If you said Field of Dreams. The one constant through all the years, Ray, has been baseball. You're correct. Now, back to the show. Director Mark Bellington is here. Survive is the name of the movie. It's available on DVD and VOD platforms as well. And uh, as we speak, uh, Mark directed it. It's amazingly shot film. And I don't know, where did I, it's written down here. Where did you shoot this film? Uh, Latvia and the Italian Alps, the Dolomites. It looked pretty harrowing, I mean, to direct that, and pretty cold. (laughs) It was. uh, And the Dolomites are like one of the most incredible mountain ranges in the world. And they're like, we're going there because it's cheap and cheap labor in Latvia. And avalanche, rock, Climbing, rock jumping, wolf chase. I mean, the thing is a total action spectacle. And the irony is we made it for this app called Quibi on your phone. And then Quibi went under, and it kind of was just disappeared. And then this great company, Freestyle, picked it up and is now putting it out as a movie. And that's what we shot it for. We intended to see it as a movie. Sophie Turner. Was that Katzenberg? Who was Quibi? Katzenberg. Couple of old MTV folks, Doug mm-hmm. Herzog. Oh, Doug Herzog. Yeah, sure. And like everybody was jumping on the Quibi bandwagon. It's like because you could go make something for them, license it to them, and you could then go sell it yourself back. But it just their timing was bad with um, COVID. There was uh, my friend Nick Santora did some stuff uh, for them, and it was like nine to 12 minute bites. Is that is that yeah, was yeah, the well, format? Yeah, yeah, like 10, 10 minutes. So you take a film and drop it into 10-minute clips, 10-minute segments. Right. Uh, which isn't the ideal way to watch a movie, but they figured, you know, hey, people, you know, kids are watching stuff in short form, so 25 mm-hmm. minutes, how about 10 minutes? It didn't matter because the point was you were getting the rights to your movie back after a year and could go sell it to a streamer. So it was like, it's almost like a farm system for your, right. for your movie, really. Were, was it? Were they intending it to be uh, watched in like portrait mode or vertical video? Yes, they said you could watch it in both. Okay. Right, so you had to kind of shoot for both, which means, like, keep it a little more in the center. I don't think what they anticipated was that once they told people you couldn't watch it on your computer or your TV, that's where they misjudged it. Right. Because people didn't want to be told where they could or couldn't watch it. So how'd you get involved with doing all the music videos back in the day? (sighs) Well, I started, actually, out of college working at MTV in the 80s. Got an internship, then was just there being a little intern and a PA making the promos in between the videos. Um, 
in the early 80s, mid 80s. And then on the weekends, you do like a De La Soul video or Information Society or PM Dawn. So I kind of cut my teeth working on the weekends and making promos at MTV. So like living in New York in the 80s was the greatest and doing videos just started then and continues to this day. Although the budget have shrunk to like a tenth of what they used to be. And you were like, well, I don't know. I mean, you're physically cutting tape, right? Well, you you physically cut film. Tape was just like, you know, was still, you were scrolling through tapes. It was definitely mm -hmm. analog working on tape before before the Avid, before Premiere, before nonlinear, which really came about in the kind of uh, 93, 94 is when like tape started to go away. So what's the what's the argument for music videos having a lesser budget? Because I feel like I know obviously we don't have MTV or VH1 circulating music videos twenty four seven, but but online, I mean, you have some videos get billions of views. Well, I think that as the record industry changed, and once there wasn't a centralized place where music videos could be seen like MTV, and as digital as like the the music business changed once it started to become streaming, right? And therefore, there was no central place to get videos seen, therefore really put a lot of emphasis on them. The way Seinfeld used to have 20 million people watching it, now the number one TV show has like 300,000. So everything just got fragmented, and that's what happened to the music video business. It wasn't like one video play could break, a, you could go sell 5 million records because MTV played it 10 times. It just kind of collapsed, which made it more democratic, but also made it harder for anybody to say, well, why are we going to spend $500,000 on a video? You know, so there's a few like Taylor Swift and it's all shifted to pop and hip hop and stuff like that. But for most of the people like rock music, what's the last great rock band that you've yeah. heard of that's like been a national big thing? That has not, that's not 40 years old. Yeah, is that, mean, because it is true. Like we know fighters, Foo fighters I mean, it's like, but that's, they're still yeah. kind of like, I love Dave and made a video for them, but like in the last ten years, I can't think of like a rock band that like nobody's protested, nobody's writing shit about how fucked up the world is. Like, what happened? You know, what, where, where, where are the angry people? Where are the people saying this is fucked up? Yeah, it's Beyonce and Harry Styles and yeah. and Taylor I mean, Swift. Taylor and Swift actually has probably more political commentary in her stuff. Than a lot of bands. It was that Donald Glover thing was the last thing that I saw that was like, wow, this is really saying something about the world we live in now. Yeah. But like, look, hey, people could be like, hey, it's just shut up. People just want to be entertained or I don't know. Well, maybe it's cyclical, you know, and we should think about that. And then is it cyclical if there's no platform? And I'll explain. So, I think it's not mass anymore. I think well, it's just yes. it's not like it's so, harder to get consensus. Right. So then then it won't be cyclical in the sense that in order for something to sort of be cyclical, it needs to be mass. It, it needs to be everyone needs to ingest it. So we go from peg leg pants in the 60s to bell bottoms in the early 70s, right? So somebody went, I want my pants super straight and tight around my ankle and then at some point four and a half years later they go fuck it we're flaring it out Flare them out so we just we just go and somebody goes well, why does anyone want bell bottoms like there's no bell there's no purpose for a bell bottom it's not really practical you step on it get shit on it whatever you go the reason we want this is because my dad wore those pants and now i'm wearing these pants and i always think about it Right off of Neil Young and all the Vietnam protests and all the Joni Mitchell and the list goes on and on. We get Donna Summer and the village people. Yep. Like we get the exact opposite yep. of Ford Dead in Ohio and all these, all that music. Pow. We yeah. get disco get balls and we get, and then, and then that gives way to punk a new wave is a, a reaction. new wave. And that's a reaction to disco, and then and then a reaction to that. Then we get all new wavy and punky. What's the opposite of punk? Hair bands, and then what's the opposite of hair band? Nirvana. Yep. You know, if you take a look at music, you'll just go as a society, 
every like seven years reaction. We just go, we're going to react to what that thing yeah. is with something different. Now we used to be able to do that because everyone had peg legs and then everyone went to bell bottoms. Now there's no consensus. So as a society, do we all react to this and change it because we're too scattered and maybe I, we don't. I think so. And I think the music business, if you track it with the the fragmentation of broadcast technology, all leading to the phone, right? So the phone just leveled everybody, yeah. right? So then there is no protest. That's like the one thing everybody has is a fucking phone, right? That's the unifier. But it's so individualized and so fragmented that everybody writes – their own channel, their own, their own thing. So everybody's their own star. Everybody's their own captain of their own ship. And it's harder and harder. And it's faster. So it's like, oh, shit, more, more ephemeral, more distracted. Mm-hmm. Doesn't matter. So you, you're right. You're tracking that historical thing. And I don't know whether it was like Columbine or but it's like something happened, 99. Because I made a movie called Arlington Road. 99, one of the best years for e- movies ever. But... Right around the beginning, right as the 2000s happened, it started to be like, I don't know. Like, where's that consensus? Right before the smartphone economic collapse of 2008, and it's been just like kind of a shit show. But good stuff. You think, oh, great bands, great movies, great stuff, but just all, it's like to each their own. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? But that's, hey, for artists who want to go make music and plug it in, and Billie Eilish and her brother, fucking great. Or somebody wants to go make a movie, like, Everything all at once, boom. Those guys were great video makers. I, I think there's still great art being made. I think there's just, I'm older now. I started MTV when I was in my 20s. We gobbled up punk and hip hop and William Burroughs and all that shit in my 20s. I'm 60 now. It's like, hmm, okay, who's making, I don't know who's making shit for me. I don't know. Because <laughs> well, I don't feel they still, 60. They still but make caskets. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But, you know, so I just, you know, you all just want to, you, you just got to, like, find the good stuff and turn people on to it. You wonder, so I just took a road trip, and uh, we got in a rental car, and uh, Mike August I was traveling with, he plugs his phone into, I don't know what app, and he's just got the, the one with the Nora Jones and, you know, kind of easy listening, you know? And, you know, Harry Connick Jr. and uh, Michael Buble and stuff like that. And and I was like, all of it's great. And I haven't heard of any of these. I mean, I've heard of Michael Buble. But what I'm saying is I haven't heard of most every artist that is on this playlist with a bunch of really good music. I haven't even heard of them. And that, it didn't work that way in the past. No, there's tons of, well, did you used to listen to the radio? You used to go to the record store and buy records and people would say, oh, you should get this CD and stuff, you know, people don't buy that. I'm again, I sound like the old guy in the lawn with like, but I still have all my old fucking vinyl and cassettes, and I still listen to this shit. Yeah. But no, like, I'm a pure, I'm an old school purist. We, I mean, this generation, like the younger generation, they, they kind of take it for granted now. All the music coming out because you can just listen to whatever you want on demand and on to the next. So where bands aren't even releasing albums anymore, they're just releasing singles throughout the year because nobody could listen to an album and just let it die. Two weeks later, it's because everyone just moves on to the next. Listen to a whole record. Like, my daughter's 21 years old. If I said, when's the last time you listened to an entire record all the way through? <laughs> can't, re- th- can't remember. No. Like, the whole, the whole like, 10 songs. Even when they're sequenced now, they're not even, like, sequences. Yeah. Like, it's just, you're right. Singles, it's shorter. Yeah. But that's, that's technology. That's just what, what's happened. It's just shorter, faster, quicker. Yeah. Drive so, through instantaneous. That's so let's the way circle, it is. So let's circle now back to Quibi because right. Quibi on paper looks like it would have been great because your uh, Survive was actually released in like 12 episodes or yeah, something I think like 12, that. 10 12? minute episodes. Right. But you, but you, the whole time you wanted it to be a movie when you were filming it and when you were writing or I mean, we, when you were We designed it. it and shot it that yeah. way. So when you edited it together, normally you go shoot a movie and you put it all together after everything you shot and it's like, Fuck, this thing's three and a half hours long. How do we get it down to two hours? In this instance, we put them all together. It flew like a motherfucker. And we put stuff back in, like stuff on a phone, a big aerial shot. You're like, shit, that's too too short on the big screen. So we put stuff back in. It only took a week to do the feature version because we had already done it 
for the nine minute segments. And it's a good thing in a movie, like have something happen every nine minutes. Yeah. It's pretty good. You'll be entertained. Agreed. You know what I mean? Which is good. So it plays really well. It moves fast. It's good. It's just good action and adventure. And it's got a little mental health message in there too. The girl has mental health issues and she starts off wanting to off herself and she learns how to live. I mean, right. that's the basic message. But And also when it was on Quibi, it wasn't like the first like two or three episodes all within a mental health institution. So if you're trying to watch this show. Yeah, and people thought it was like, I'm I'm getting triggered. I'm not watching it. Yeah, you think it's something entirely different than what, what it actually is. Right, because if they get TV shows reviewed, they'll review the first three episodes, which is three 30-minute or three one-hour episodes. But if you're going to watch three nine-minute episodes, like exactly like you said, people thought it was something else. I'm uh, looking down on it's all your, marketing. your mm. cheat sheet here, my cheat sheet. Uh, your dad was an all pro linebacker, played with the Baltimore Colts for 12 seasons, which is wow. Mm -hmm. That sounds like a dream. Sounds like a dream to me. Great guy. A dream back when you could clothesline people. What was it like being a star? My dad was a badass. I got pictures of my dad literally with his arm up. He played with a cast one year for in eight games. He broke his arm and they wrapped it up in plaster and he played with it. It would crack guys' heads open. Yeah. Crazy. They didn't have rules. They had some rules, but like, not like the like rules they have now. His first year, they didn't have face masks. His first year in 1953. <laughs> and then the next year, they got little plastic things here. <laughs> his helmet, which we still have at home, my brother and I like argue about like who gets to keep it, was less padding inside than my like junior high helmet. Yeah. My, so my dad, unfortunately, also got CTE after he retired. And I made a film about him. And he got Alzheimer's when he was 60. Wow. All from Jeez. total from that stuff. So, you know, 30 years ahead of time, he was, that was devastating. But great guy. And he, uh, he used to kick ass. He had two, you know, two world championship rings to his name. So, yeah. You know, Jim Brown just died, right? Do you remember Jim Brown? Sure. The, one of my greatest photos is my father vaulting up to tackle Jim Brown. In the 1964 World Championship game, like in the wow. cold in Cleveland yeah. and mud. And now, you know, it's it's interesting. It's like all those great black and white photos of boxing matches, you couldn't do them today because they don't allow smoking. And see, back then, <laughs> everyone ringside had a cigar. Hell yeah. Right? And so the smoke it is haze. with the black and white, I mean, you could – such art, it's right? It's dramatic. Yeah. Right. And those old football pictures with the muddy field and the black and white and it, everything was just kind of, now everything is artificial turf, it, turf oh, yeah. and lit. Everything's lit and everything. It just, it just didn't have that kind of grit nope. that they, have, lost they had back then. They lost it in, I think, the late 70s. You know, Len Dawson from the Chiefs, there's a great photo of him oh, yeah. smoking on the sidelines. Some guys used to, like, right. smoke on the sidelines of a game. There's one of him in the locker room, right? Super Bowl. Yeah, Super Our Bowl. Or championship. I, like I'm halftime or something. Yeah. I did it years ago. I did a Gatorade commercial, and then they did a follow-up one with Len Dawson. And we went to Kansas City Arrowhead and shot... I mean, just to like tr throw the ball with Len Dawson, that was pretty fucking cool. Yeah, cigarette. Yeah, yeah there you go. Cigarette and a fresca. Look at him. Yeah, um, that's badass. And those cleats. I used to have cleats like that. Rydell. S Rydell. Or, yeah. yeah, not Spot Bill. Did you play football? Yeah, yeah. Not like your dad. Where? Where'd you play? North Hollywood High and then Junior Valley College. The North Hollywood High, what? Or the, what was the team's name? Where were the Huskies? Huskies. Yeah. What was your color scheme? <laughs> uh, it was the same as the Detroit Lions. Okay. It was like uh, blue and silver or whatever. Right. And it was a kind of decent. See so if decent you can call looking. up the new yeah, Detroit Lions helmets and tell me if they're not like Robocop. Oh, really? The, oh, the they, did oh they did that. worse. Uh, they they did went the off helmet? and now did the stupid helmet. Oh, mm. fucking. Look, if you, go back and, if you go back and look at the Patriots old uniform versus the new uniform. It is, the old one is so much better. That's why everyone loves like throwback nights when everyone yes. knows, where's the old stuff. One of the greatest things I have from all the memorabilia that I have from my dad's is like the old programs, like 1962. Right. And there was 12 teams in the NFL. It's like there's the helmet, the Redskins, the right. Bears, the Packers. So the logos that have stayed the same are my favorites, the Niners, the Packers. 
Just yeah, the simple. Bears. Simple. Right. Yeah, and then uh, the uh, the Bengals went with the tiger shit, and it just it <laughs> got it. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. And I don't think. And now here's here's my argument. I can go back and pull out chicks from Playboy from when I was in high school, and people go, you're just an old fart, wax and poetic about it. I go, no, no, they're hotter than your modern chick. They're curvier, they're better. Like, these are better. This isn't us just being old farts. This The, the <laughs> New England Patriots uniform was better than the current New England Patriots uniform. Yes, and Deborah Jo Fondren was better than... right. With, Playboy Playmate X. I don't know. Does Playboy there, even exist? Anymore? I don't even think so. Yeah, yeah. Deborah Joe with that long blonde hair. Remember her? Yeah. So you worked with Pearl Jam. You worked with you two, but also worked with Michael Jackson, and Bruce Springsteen. And Michael Matthews. Jackson was a posthumous video. I did his first oh. one after he died. A lot of what pressure. was that like? That was really intense. They're like, here's a lot of money. Here's a song he did with Akon. So you were dealing with his estate and um, I think John Branca, a lawyer. And it was very important that, like, that, they, that they signed off on it because they were very protective of his legacy the and what the, the message is and what the imagery and what the feeling was. And that was a great – that was like, here, just go do whatever you want to this song. It was really, it was really lovely. Great song. And how did they – did they supply you with imagery? There was a lot of footage. So we played around with a lot of like live footage of his and did some effects and you know, you know, it wasn't like, oh, do a deep fake of Michael and bring Michael back to life. Just kind of pay tribute, do a duet, but you don't have him to use their singing, but you know, a couple little lines you'd see his face and you could feel like he was there. Because this was not not long after he died. What was the uh, Bruce Springsteen project? I did two videos for him. I did uh, Lonesome Day and uh, Girls in Their Summer Clothes. Lonesome Day from The Rising and then um, um, Girls in Their Summer Clothes. And he just was a great guy. Great. And talk about, like, you meet him and, like, hey, talk to Bruce. And uh, you talk about the Jersey Shore. You talk about Alzheimer's because his wife's dad had Alzheimer's. So you end up talking about just all these things that we're talking about. Jersey, Alzheimer's, football family, stuff like that. And he was a great guy. Just super, super down to earth. What about when you filmed uh, U2 3D? Like how much did the band have, uh, say? how much say did they have when they were, when you were filming that? Like did they choreograph anything or was it all? Like, yeah, that was in did, Buenos Aires. And I co-directed that with a woman named Catherine Owens. And my role was to really like kind of like just help pull it all together. Now at that time, 3D was like pretty new to the, New to the world. We got all of James Cameron's cameras that he had at the time. And right. if anybody's ever seen YouTube live, you, you can't take a bad shot. With their screens and their set design and stuff like that, Like all you had to do was put the camera in the right place. But I did convince them with 3D, like you can't only get the cameras so close. And I convinced them to do like 15 songs worth just so we could shoot them close up, um, which we did an extra day in uh, Mexico City. Meaning don't move around so much, don't run around? Okay, or? so if they're on a big stage, if you started to put those big 3D cameras right in front of them, people would be like... Can't see around them. Can't see. But you wanted those close-up performance so it's not all long-lens telephoto. When you watch mm -hmm. you know, old concert stuff, a lot of times like close-ups are like shot from very far sure. away. So we were able to say, what are the key 12 of the 18 songs we think are going to be in the film? Because they didn't want to just do a whole other gig for free. I mean, you know, like and blow out their vocals and stuff like that. So, oh, yeah, was, we, it, was it not in front of an audience? It, the r film was, but we got like a bunch yeah, of the close ups, ups, right? For like 12 or 14 songs, we we're like right here. Okay, no here audience. No, no audience. Oh, okay. Right. No oh, okay. audience. Just cut that in. Yeah. So you move the cameras up. Yep. Move them right up on the stage. Their concerts must not have a bad shot because they're doing that. Sphere in Vegas, right there, don't they open? Yeah, I want to go see that. I want to go yeah. see that. But they, they're they incredible and they're always state of the art. I mean, number one, they're great guys. I saw Bono's um, Surrender, his spoken word thing, which he had published this memoir. I don't, did you I didn't know see about it. that? It was unbelievable. It was one of the greatest nights of emotion and entertainment. He did 
a book, which was his memoir, which is really told in 40 songs. And he did it with like a harpist, a sound designer, a um, a person playing harp, person playing piano. And he just did it at the Orpheum Theater. It was like unbelievable. I think he also just did eight nights at the Beacon in New York. And they're making a movie out of it. I uh, I know he's doing the Vegas orb, whatever that is. Sphere, yeah. Sphere. And um, I don't know what to make of that place. I've never been in it. I mean, anyone listening probably knows it's a thick, huge globe that they've been working on for many years, and they're going to open it. And they're doing, and they're doing Octung Baby. That's how I started working with them. With in 1990, I did a bunch of stuff for their visuals for Zoo TV. And mm-hmm. Zoo TV was inspired by a TV show I had made for MTV called Buzz, which was pre-internet, pre-multi, like screens overwhelming you, kind of like 20 years ahead of its time. So Zoo TV was that tour for Octoon Baby. That's what they're doing at the Sphere, the multi-screen, multi-barrage stuff, but now for the new technology. Now, I mean, I don't even know what it is. Do you go in and just... Is it like kind of a virtual like, thing you're surrounded by? Yeah, 360. I don't know, but we're gonna find out because this thing's opening soon. I don't, I don't know yeah, when, but I'm, I'm gonna be in Vegas Friday. Actually, is that the sphere? Yeah, it looks yeah. even more completed now. I think. Oh no, it's turning colors from the outside, yeah. so it's either working or it's jealous or something. <laughs> <laughs> it's a mood sphere it's scheduled for September 29th this year. September oh, wow. 29th. Yeah, so that's they- coming. Am I? I'm at Jimmy's Comedy Club Friday and Saturday, or is something wrong with our our list? We'll figure it I out. Just heard Friday. Sorry. Huh. Well, I'll maybe look online. Yeah. Well, there are no more rules, and but the the answer for everyone all the time. You know, you get to MTV fresh out of college in the '80s or while in college. Just show up, people. Just show up. You want to go to everybody who's doing what they want to do in their 40s and 50s and even 30s just showed up, just showed up at the place they wanted to do it without even a title, without necessarily a paycheck, without credentials, without anything. They just showed up. And then every story... You know, Jimmy Kimmel has showing up at the radio station. I show up at the radio station. He showed up at MTV. I showed up on MTV at, at, <laughs> at some point. Brian Grazer just like showed up places. So like you just show up, which I, I it's a way oversimplification of something that works perfectly. But that's the answer. It just works. show up. And work for free. If you work for free, you're definitely in. Oh, yeah. And just be part of it. And then you're on, you're inside. And MTV that at that time was like, there was no focus groups. There was no foreign. There was no ad sales. There was no like. Literally, my we would wear bathing suits to work, and we're like, "Hey, what if I tried this thing?" They're like, "Go try it." Like there was no wow. rules. They would be like, "You could go try something and see it on the air the next day," and you're like, "Holy shit!" Yeah. Some of those bumpers that you probably created yeah. were some of the most creative bumpers you'd ever seen. You don't see like uh, the Joe's apartment ones where Joe's the guy apartment. lives with cockroaches. That was, yep. That's right. Man. That was my um, friend. I remember I made one one time. People were using like on commercials, using a lot of text, like big text. Mm-hmm. And I got home that night and I used one. I wrote something said, these are words like tiny text, tiny. And I went and made it and got on the air. And it was basically this little piece that kind of like insulted the viewer and said, these words are just sitting here like you. And I was like, did the TV just kind of tell me I was being passive? Yes, mm-hmm. it did. But you could you, you could just go make it, and they didn't care. One person, Judy McGrath, was like, go ahead. So it's thanks to her. Now. Otherwise, I think you just keep going. I said I had no training in that, no training in video or music or anything. It was like you do music first, then picture. So when I did my first movie, 1997, I was like, what do you mean I don't pre-mix the music? Everything had always been <laughs> music and emotion first, picture second, right? So you just kept trying and trying new things, and you said, I'm just going to stay here in New York till somebody tells <laughs> me that I suck. So you got to go to L.A. to have people tell you that you suck. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? And get into Hollywood, like, okay, they had you that, suck. They had that whole <laughs> Dennis Leary. I knew Leary when he was doing One. the first the first promos that Ted Demi, my dear late Ted Demi friend, directed. Is like, oh, this guy Leary, and like, I remember just getting fucking hammered with Leary at, at 
going out at night to like <laughs> bars in New York. And then who was the second, the cab driver guy? That was um, that was Jimmy the cab driver played by Donald Logue. Donald Logue. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. You remember that? Yeah. 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 That was super funny, too. I Gilbert mean, Gottfried started on MTV. All these characters. I remember meeting John Stewart. I remember when Sandler started there. I mean, all those guys just, look, I mean, a, a great history of people that started at that network. Because it was risk. It was a risk. They would just take risks. Yeah. Now it's it? uh, what episode of Ridiculousness could we play? <laughs> it's literally... Every once in a while, because I remember going through MTV and being on MTV and 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 all the the, the salad days of, of MTV, and every once in a while, I'll just be in a hotel room scrolling or something. It's like <laughs> MTV, and I'm like, maybe there's something on MTV. Ridiculousness. That's that's twenty four seven. I mean, <laughs> to the point where if you said to me, "Is there anything else on MTV?" I would say, "Not in my experience," because I I check in every three and a half weeks at all different times, and that's it. Oh, we have we have Jimmy the cab driver promo for Alanis Morissette. He has to go. We got him. He's a security guy. He got a brown clip on tie. And uh, three days later, I come walking. I'm wearing brown pants, matches his tie. Irony, <laughs> don't you think? <laughs> it's like uh, when uh, Jimmy Moriarty punches you in the face, but you know, m although it breaks your nose, it really hurts his right hand. Yeah, it's like playing a two dollar scratch it lottery ticket and losing. <laughs> come back here. It's like rain. <laughs> On a rainy day. It's like going crazy when you're already nuts. Uh -huh. Hey, get back in the window. Isn't that ironic? Don't you think? It's like meeting the girl of your dreams and finding out she's five. When you believe in your heart of hearts that the moon is made of cheese, but when you look at cheese, you don't think it's the same stuff that makes up the moon. <laughs> it's absurd. Isn't that ironic? Don't you think? Yeah, they would never do that. Well, especially the five-year-old girl of your dreams. No, but no, you couldn't even out. smoke. You, you'd be, you'd have a, you'd have a three week argument where you'd go, can he smoke? And then at some point, the legal team would say he can hold a cigarette, but it can't be lit. And then you'd go, what the fuck are we even talking about? They go, those are the rules. He's going to have a cigarette. He can talk about smoking or he can hold a cigarette that's not lit, but he can't talk about smoking. And you'd just be like, what the fuck are we doing? And that's what it turned into. What year was that? I'd say 90. We're looking. One? It was after Larry. I, I remember we made when we made this TV show Buzz, like literally the shit was on the air. Like we were two episodes before while the legal person was going through it. Like, now I'm not sure we may have put something. <laughs> we're like, okay, we're just gonna like, okay, we're just gonna yeah. get it on. Ask for forgiveness. They had later. so much going on, they couldn't, they couldn't keep track of it. It yeah, was, like that right there. I know Jesse Peretti directed that, and Donald. They just fucking did it and like made it, and like it was also whatever length you wanted it to be because it was ultimately the ultimate streamer. Because MTV had no like you, the promos didn't have to be thirty or sixty. It's like whatever they were Real was loose. what they were. Yeah, Jimmy well, the they, cab driver. I mean, they felt right. <laughs> Jimmy the cab driver, not not till ninety six. So yep. So I think that was that. right at the end of when were you there? Not. Pff. 97, 98, yeah, probably. I, th I think that when people say, I think at the end of the 90s, early 2000s, I remember still doing videos, 2002, 2000, I think it was around 2004 when, uh, and they started then when they took the music away from the title, from music television, that was the, that was the nail in the coffin. Yeah, as early as '94. You're basically saying when I got there, that's essentially no. You, but you pushed it into that, the ground. Yeah, <laughs> it was not in a ravine, but I shoved it into a ravine. No, but thank God you were there to still feel part of that that rebellious quality, that rebellious spirit. I mean, even the Jersey Shore stuff. I don't know. I lost track of it when they stopped playing videos all the time because I liked music and I liked videos. When it was like, well, if you like survival movies. <laughs> Uh, survive amazing I I watched the uh, the feature or I watched the, the promo for it and it's it's exquisitely shot thank you uh, it it's exciting beautiful I like cliffhanger so don't you know I, I, oh. you, you go up to the, the movie Alps. cliffhanger if you ask oh, both. anything Fun. in the snow <laughs> I, anything on a okay. cliff anything in the Alps I'm in I will tell you in the snow them along the ledge of a snow thing and between what was real and stunt people and effects and you look, I look at the final thing we watched on a big screen a couple weeks ago. 
because we had like one big screen screening before it goes on this fucking thing, you know? <laughs> it was like, yeah. wow, that's what it was made for. And it cool. made me think of the movie Cliffhanger, which yeah. is like, I, it's, I might go watch that movie tonight. <laughs> I, it's, it's worth a watch. It from, still yeah. holds up. Let's it all holds get Michael up. Rooker. You got to get Michael Rooker on. We've had him on, and uh, he's, he's great. Everyone is great. I mean, um, what's Lithgow? his name? Lithgow. Lithgow plays the greatest villain ever. Li- my friend, Caroline Goodall, played... Lithgow's girlfriend. Yeah, you know, she's like the bra- great. She's great. And she's she is and they shot it actually in on the top of um the Dolomites. Wow. Yep. Well maybe it's that's a full what circle. Came rushing back to me. Survive. It's available on DVD and VOD platforms as we speak. Mark Pellington, uh, thank you so much for Thanks for having us. Andrew Lopez as well. Andrew Lopez.me as well. Until next time. This is Adam from Mark and Andrew and Chris saying. Mahalo. Well, I'm going to be at